God. She's just a spiteful bitch that will sick her hey. followers on you like Mr. Burns and his hounds for the tiniest thing. <laughs> Please tell me you have it. Alright, so I, I don't know if you guys, it, but I if I ever said eyes, this before, but uh, yeah, yeah I actually do enjoy uh, listening to stuff <laughs> in the background while I'm drawing. So, yeah, that's the reason why that's there. Um, yeah, uh, for today, I was thinking of working on this. Which is gonna be a complete revamp of this avatar I made. Let me try to find the actual document, the original one. Let me pop it in here. Uh, the, pr the problem with this one is that I did it like quickly just to make the little uh, Beatitude um, PNG tuber. Uh, and uh, after I did the four frames, I just dumped this out. But let me see. Chimmy Avatar, I think I called it. And adults subjecting kids to NSFW constantly, Let's manipulating see. people into harassing people and sure, just here being a massive Oop. prick online. I'm sure this could have uh, possibly be foreshadowing for future events. Fuck shit. Oh my god, I'm gonna fucking hang myself. Yeah, this is it's well made overall. Time, Puppy but talking about the, the mouth <laughs> Especially the mouth was anime. not made. We get it was not made at all season. for like I you life to D, so I decided no, like, okay, I'm gonna just get rid of this thing. And uh, I'm gonna make it from scratch. I really like the eyes, so I'm gonna try something different uh, for the eye shape and the eye shadow that I saw on another person's live to the um, character. But yeah, that this is what I'm gonna do for now, and also in the meantime, because I have it easy and I cannot do the same thing over ever, uh, like. I would say over and over for like, like I'd say for, for too long, clothes, so I have this commission, uh, sticker commission that I have to finish for someone on Telegram. They're, most of them are like cute, like blushing, blushing, and ink at you, laughing, you know. So, yeah, I'm gonna finish this. I really love the expressions I did on this. It's so well made. Anyway, uh, buzzword for these yeah people. Let's oh i'm in the wrong well you're here. taking me out of context the flex uh, is successful i win fucking hell so yeah let's start let's you start uh if you hear a voice in the, in the background it's why is my okay i didn't know why but it's a start playing on my own uh on my end <laughs> <laughs> but uh basically look so short uh i might not check uh chat that often because um i only have one screen let me tell you this it, it's it's weird honestly it's, it's very weird because um when uh when i set up this thing to work right to start working on it um i i don't know why but the the audio is so loud i don't know why anyway uh let me post about it sorry if i'm going off topic but daft is probably one of the most irritating people ever he is literally the king of building a narrative that's my next video, by the way. I was thinking, like, of making it available for anyone to join and be like, um... Give a sec. Uh... Oh, I was gonna say, like, I, I, I was thinking of making it available for anyone to join the voice call, but I was thinking, Free, like, uh, maybe free. not. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, in future, I'm going to get the little text-to-speech that people can um, send messages towards, and the little text-to-speech thing is going to, like, um... Let me make this a little bit lighter, like, there. there you go. So, I like the eye shape, because the full open eye shape, why am I drawing on white? I don't know growing up in the 1960s uh, and we're being fed all so. the news and social propaganda about how gay people should stay in the closet this and how it's unnatural and against nature and all sorts of 
crazy shit like that. Okay. A lot of you would probably be anti-gay, anti-LGBT. Give me one yeah, second. basically the same thing when you compare notes. The LGBT community likes fucking people. There you go. Uh, okay, I like the eye shape. Yeah, it's it's cute. But fortunately, today's video won't be on a person on our own if we attract this. What I didn't like were the big eyelashes because uh, I was showing something new back then. I like the eyelashes. I'm not. I'm not gonna deny that. Like they look great. Uh. Daft Tina is respected by people. Yeah, he's respected by people. The reason I've titled the video this way, other than for the funny clicks, is because I want to cover a situation. Give me one. I want to make her mouth smaller, first of all, and I also want to uh, change her eye shape because uh, the original eye shape was too sexy, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I don't have one. Goddamn fools. Idiots. I like the big forehead and the little anyway, ear tough. The ears. The ears are a little bit too big for my opinion. I would make it like here big. No, a little bit shorter. I am. This entire thing started off with the 17 year old joining Tina's 18 plus Patreon. This is important information as the minor should have abided by the rules set. Now, I know for a fact. Alright, so. To say, Oranges, are you once again blaming the minor for the trouble they put themselves in? Not entirely. Not the entire situation, but part of it. Tina could not at all be blamed for not knowing the 17 year old as well. 17 and 16 at the time. From Tina's point of view, that person they were DMing at the time was at least an 18 year old. So anything before the 17 year old came out isn't good evidence to prove that tina is a quote unquote group me since once again they didn't know now what about this situation let me make it more curvy old, age? why didn't you mention in this post that when the minor told you their age that you kept exchanging nudes with them Ooh. here's my argument though tina said in that dms that there was only a two year age gap which means oh boy this is valid true Wait, they ask? Wait, what, 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 what am I losing? Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I'm just going to use my own personal belief as a kid who grew up in the UK to give my opinion. The age of consent in the UK and some states in the US is 16. That is not an opinion, that is a fact. I grew up with okay, being good. the norm. Fucking slash. I grew up with that being the norm, so I see nothing wrong with that relationship. It okay. looks completely normal to me in the outside. I defend the relationship, but then Tina had to fuck up everything by getting the 17 year old to send nudes. God fucking damn it. Ah boy, here we go. Sick. Now I literally can not defend this because a quick Google search has told me that the nudity from anyone under the age of 18 is considered child. Oh man. Cheese pizza. <clears throat> On an unrelated note, this Google search is also putting me in a list. I cannot defend All right. that. At least her nose. Her nose was good in size. So I would still keep this. Let me just. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the nose is good in size because that will, yeah, that will fit. Now, this is where, in in the one like that's right below, I don't know why the mouth is so big. It goes all the way to here. It's so big. <laughs> it should be like here or something. I'm going to read a screen for content. Oh yeah, that is so much better. Oh my goodness, that changes everything. <laughs> Whoa, how how can one line change so much about? I'm asking that it would have study for years, yeah. I'm so smart. Anyway. So long before this tweet came out, I received several emails linked to the let me just make it a little bit more rounded here. Because I don't... Hmm. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's a little bit more cute. So, her little lips is going to be... No, 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 that's not good. Uh, here. It's just some people don't like the whole lip thing. I love the little lip thing. Like, they have the lips, the lower lips. Like, for example, if I go online, let me grab a picture of a tiger. Um, tiger. Uh, looking at the photo. This video wasn't even me trying to defend Tina or anything, but how the fuck So if I show you a picture of a tiger, even here, uh, it's loading. Copy image. Alright. Let me do it on another canvas.
Look, it has a little lip, and people don't like it, and they're like, oh no, you're supposed to draw like just this. And I'm like, no, they have a little, little tiny lip. It's, a, it's not like they have a big lip like this, no. They have a line here. Like this. Shows up. And I tried to do that on her add the little lip actually now that i look at it it's kind of too thick said, i will never work with you or watch your videos as the videos i've watched have been extremely disrespectful okay bias af and when you inevitably leave this dm let me explain to your audience why i feel this way okay that's so much better oh my goodness let me let me make a little thing here yeah yes that is so cute my post, but I shall bring up yours. That is so cute. Oh my goodness. I was going to ask you Why are you so cute? Been, but I never got a response. My argument still stands. Okay. How can you ignore your own personal morals and pride that this person is a pedo? And I'm not even talking about the fact that you, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, this is a personal decision I make as it's easier to show a character smiling if they had this little thing on the side. Their relationship is completely legal from my perspective. <laughs> Saying nigga doesn't make you racist. Working! On request! Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I don't even know if my mic is working. I'm, I've been talking this whole time. Uh, <laughs> as, if, as if my uh, microphone was working. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alright. So, I like big fluffy cheeks. I know that tigers don't really have that much floof. Like, it's a little square, you know. If you look at it you know but i like to do it like this you know exaggerated and that's what i'm gonna do with her like if you pay attention i did do the square in the last one and she looks like a tiger but um let's make it extra foofy this time and i'm gonna do something different also um comparing it to the, the last one it's gonna make my work progress a little bit slower but i'm not gonna make the cheeks um let me do a guideline here that's better okay so um i'm doing the sketch right now like um they're symmetrical but when i do the final art i'm gonna turn off the symmetry and i'm gonna do cheek and cheek because that uh, like full symmetry i don't know if you guys know but if you make a character fully symmetrical it actually kills it like I, it, it looks ugly to uh, uh, the average person it's like too perfect to where it's it doesn't look nice anymore so I get you want to keep your platform. I know you can just stay on to draw, but okay. at the same time, I feel like transparency should be met. Regardless of how you feel about your own personal Sick. image, you really should attack just the person just to get back with them after you broke up with them. It was a really shitty thing to nice. do, and yeah, you deserve criticism for that. The same way you Look at the difference. Oh my goodness. The same way you deserve criticism for the fact All that right. you decided to double down. And Her neck is also very big. Lying to people as well. However, again, Jack has also done some bad stuff, no. which I will be talking about. Back onto what I've said in the past. This is when Tina also apologized for catfishing. <coughs> I don't think people understand how severe this is. It wasn't Tina playing a persona like what I do. It was them using a fake identity in order to get back in contact with a 17 year old. Okay. Once, I'm just going to say something objectively. Regardless of who you are, regardless of how you feel about your own personal identity, there is no way you can... Give me a one sec. I don't the like quote, this part. Uh... One of the most damning claims out of all of this. However, I want to highlight a little quote in that apology. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. You can use your girl. She's so cute. That's what I, I want people to, to say when they see Chumi. Be like, oh, my gosh, she's so cute. I don't want people to look at her and be like, ooh, sexy girl. No, no. She is my comfort character. She's not my first one. A lot of people think that she's my first one. She's not my first one. She's what I call a comfort character. Um, there's a difference between the comfort character and the fursona because, uh, uh, let me show you my actual fursona is, it's cream. It's, 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 do I have a drawing of cream here even? Where is she? Where is she? Wait, wait, I had one. Oh, 
buttons. I hate it when you press. You're, you're pressing a letter. Hey, I'm not, look, I'm uh, not on your on your like documents, and it just skips. So this this is my actual first one, right? This is a gift art that I got years ago, like two years ago, from Wesley. His username is not even Wesley anymore. <laughs> He he's still a furry, but he draws mostly. Um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, has been hotel fan art now. And uh, back then when he was full on furry only, um, he drew me that uh, as a, a little gift, and I loved it, and I still have it on my computer. I don't even have that much. Of. All the commissions I, I, I bought of her, I should actually, because uh, I've had situations in the past where the art, artist either changed their at, which is what happened here, right, or they changed their account completely, and when they, sometimes, when they switch accounts, I don't mind if you, um, how do, how do I say this, like, if you decide to, um, just start a new account and leave the old one abandoned but please like please don't just nuke everything please and I, and if you are if you are going to um i don't like that outro thing sorry oh i misclicked like dude if you're gonna like uh Nick your whole social media accounts. At least let people that bought art from you know. Hey, I'm gonna leave my account this day. You know, make a public post or something and be like, hey, I'm I'm quitting because of this reason. And then I could say like, oh yeah, yeah, it's it's my fault for not checking your social media. But a lot of artists I followed, they just go on and do it. They're like, nah. I let people know when I was gonna delete my telegram because uh, of harassment I was getting at the time. I look back at it and I'm like, dude, I could have just ignored it. But anyway, things happen. Um, but I at least I didn't download the stuff that I had published, if that makes sense. Um, all, all, all the art that I made, all the sticker packs. Um, the things I had done, this is too small, let me make it bigger. That is so much better. How did I get that so perfectly in one stroke? How? Huh. I wish, I wish everything I wanted to draw, it just happened like that. <laughs> anyway, um, alright, so... What I'm gonna do now is, let me see. It's, but the difference is so huge. Oh my. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me. Oh, I made it too too light. Let me do this. Uh, bell. Let me Google for bell reference. Like necklace bell, maybe. All right, because I know there are these that have this little shape here. Here, I found one cool. This is so nice. That is a great reference. Okay, I wasn't doing it wrong. That's that's good to know. It's very good to know. Let me listen to this video. Lower, lower the volume a little bit. Um, hey, everybody. I just wanted to show you this cool new cave design that I found. Uh, oh, hey. Uh, it's, it's really cool, and I think right. you guys are going to enjoy it. I even found some diamonds. So you may have heard of Minecraft Era 422, a Minecraft creepypasta EXE that corrupts your game. You know, it does all sorts of weird things, the world gets <laughs> messed up, random blocks spawn, and this guy called the Entity chases you down. Cool stuff. Many people then took this format and recreated it just with a different name. Like, I mean, there are a bunch of- So, what I'm gonna do with this- Era number, pretend like it's their own thing. They just do the same thing over I'm and gonna... over and over again. Eventually, you would think someone would finally do something new. However, why would you bother to do that when you can just oh, piggyback no, off something that works? Uh, Welcome to Pixels After Dark. Uh, instead of just w having this in the middle like I did on the last model, series. I'm gonna make <laughs> uh, this. Yeah, sorry about that one. Hmm, let's see. 
and I'm gonna move it around all I'm like to be. But I, I'm not gonna get there yet. I wanna do the middle part. Allow me to introduce you to Minecraft Era 437. A spooky Minecraft EXC that's basically just like all the other ones, except it apparently has a virus that interacts with the computer and causes some pretty odd occurrences. Yeah, you heard me right. All virus. right. Something so dangerous that even Google made me lower the security of my profile to download it. I had my geek squad of cybersecurity experts take a look at the file and they told me a bunch of stuff that I really didn't understand. They ran it through some program, I guess the code to run the game is disguised as another file. Other things popped up, I don't know, okay, just a major so nerd talk. Because joke, that I thing is only right, talk that about I can this thing understand. is outside, and since this isn't a malware um, analysis I'm going to be able to clip it inside of Bell and Apparently move it around so that when she moves around, it's going to look like the Bell is having the 3D effect of left and right. Oh my. Instead of having it in the middle where, in the middle, it just stayed in the middle There's and also some talk the maximum that, that it did was move here message. you know and if you run it through a windows analysis you can see a whole bunch of red lights yeah. dinging screaming malicious content however in the end i guess the only way to really there figure it out is to play it the uh, all right the you so play, the more we have that the game gets. i really like the, the fluffy thing i did here so i'm gonna so i'm gonna do that again video. play through the days and, and try let me let me do the climax. Uh, the hair. You know, I'll be honest, I'm kind of disappointed that there's no, you know, cliche creepypasta. I think we can make our own. I woke up one morning and was checking my emails. Typically, I get a funny Garfield comment from my grandmother. But today, I saw something that caught my attention. An email from Notch, creator of Minecraft. I would like to say good. I was stunned, but any excitement was quickly diminished when I saw the email. Attached was an installer for Minecraft and a video. What I saw, I could not explain. Can I change so the size of my marker? Hi, it's or me, am I just pressing? Notch. If you're watching this, I'm okay. dead. <laughs> 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 I recently tried to reclaim ownership of Minecraft as I was upset that they've removed Fireflies from the recent update. I love Firefly. During my attempt, I was assassinated by Bill Gates and... I wish I could say I saw angels on the other side, but no, only fire, scorching hot fire filled with demons, not the cartoon demons either, big, Ooh. ugly, horny gremlin type ghoul. However, luckily for me, Satan was a fan of dream manhunt videos and offered to give me the opportunity to haunt Minecraft. And that's what I'm going to do. I don't know why I'm, I'm telling you this or how I'm big. telling you this. You know, they force us to use Yahoo down here. But try playing Minecraft. You may be in for a big surprise. I was terrified. <laughs> Upon what? first opening the game, you'll see that the Mojang logo is glitched out and the original home screen will be converted to a corrupted screen. Hey! You can see that this version is based on Minecraft 1.3.2, however, they modified Do you have Streamlabs or OBS? What do pr programs do you use? I use, um... I use OBS, yeah, just fun. the basic OBS. The I don't have menu, much all the values will uh, installed. This doesn't actually mean that our sensitivity and stuff hey, are changing. Hey, should, should I call you Wesley or should I call you Markets? I, I, I'm i curious now. Because <laughs> I've been so used to calling you Wesley. Uh... Okay. <laughs> just Wesley. <laughs> the little heart is so cute. Um, I was saying earlier when I first started the, the stream that I'm not checking chat as often, so I'm sorry if you guys send me messages and you ask me questions. Uh, I might not respond or reply that fast, but uh, <laughs> I am reading chat from time to time. I'm just not concentrating that much on on reading it. Um, but yeah, uh, I saw your username and I was like, oh, that's what <laughs> Um... Also, I was I was just bragging about this little gift. Are you different? <laughs> I don't know if you joined when I did it, but yeah, I was talking about. It. Um, but yeah, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I use I use stream. Uh, not 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 stream labs OBS. I use regular OBS. Um, with the basic stuff because um. It's easier for for my computer to run it. I'm not saying Streamlabs is 
too heavy right now because the computer I have is 10 times better than the one I used to have. Um, it could run it, but I don't want to risk it. And I'm, I'm trying to use, uh, afterwards, after this is done, um, maybe tonight I could try giving a little bit of opportunity to, uh, I think, I think the website is called Streamlabs OBS or Stream... No, Streamlabs Elements. Yeah, uh, Streamlabs Elements. Streamlabs Elements is uh, the one uh, I wanted to try giving it a try. And, uh, like, have some stuff added, if that makes sense. Like, more things that you can do. Other than just throwing tomatoes. I love, I love the throwing tomatoes thing. I think it's most adorable thing I have I've ever added to the to my streams um, and uh, actually you have to pay for Streamlabs no uh, Streamlabs OBS is for free but it is too heavy not all computers can run it and that is that is a a bad bad thing on them like they make it too heavy for potato computers to run it. Um, I think they should make a light version for people with uh, potato computers. But other than that, it's good. It's good because it has a lot of things that, that are like basic that a regular person would need a lot of help with. That OBS, it OBS can do it, but it it, it requires a little bit of knowledge. You have to uh, look for tutorials kind of like a, a lot and you have to uh, you have to do a lot of on your side. It's not like click click done. You have to learn the program in order to be able to to use it, you know. And um, yeah, it's it's not new user friendly. I like I like OBS because it's simple. I just pop in like this is what I want to share. This is what I want to uh, have showing on screen. Boom, done. Uh, I'm not someone that likes all the flashy stuff that other streamers might have or might want. Which I'm I'm not saying is better or is good. If you want to have flashy images and like all those decorations and things like that, you, you can go on. You know, play around with your stream. But I'm I'm more on the side of let people have their fun. How am I doing? Um, I'm doing pretty, pretty good. Um, I had a job, uh, recently, and then I got laid off, and that's why I'm trying to stream again so that I can pass the time until I get a new job. <laughs> um, that that job was consuming my time kind of a cut a lot. Uh. Seether, Seether, he got a very, very nice job, but the only problem with his job is that it takes his time also, and that is the main reason why he has not made any new videos with, like, big production per se, like, most of the videos that he has made were videos that he was like, I feel like doing a video today, bam, video, you know, and... Some people don't like that. Some people are like, oh, this is lazy production. But at the end of the day, his his YouTube channel is a YouTube channel he created when he was a teenager. And the whole purpose was for him to record videos and talk about whatever he felt like on that day. So um, the fact that there were certain topics that blew up and made him get a little bit more attention, I think, were unrelated <laughs> Uh, his dream was never to become a popular YouTuber, and he still thinks that to this day. Um, he just hoped he could get a little bit of money out of it, like, uh, to, to pay for, uh, maybe a good video editing software, which we did. At, at the end, we ended up, uh, buying, um, we ended up buying, uh, uh, Camtasia. I don't know why, I forgot the name of the program for like 10 seconds. The name of the program was Camtasia. And, uh, let me actually get this. These colors quickly. And the green. I 
I don't think I can get the yellow. No. I'll, I'll try to work with this yellow later. Um, and this dark green for the middle bar of the eye layer. Oh, I almost forgot this shade of orange. Um, anything else? Let me see this blue. Uh, I think that's all. Yeah, that's all for now. Um, yeah, I was saying... There, there's people that were complaining about Skeeter's videos and they were like, Ooh. Could you send me your ref sheet of either Camchi or Chumi? Uh, where? Should I do it on Twitter? I see you're more, more active on Twitter than Lily. <laughs> Still the same old Skeeter. Yep. Still the same old Skeeter. Um, when it comes to... Uh, I was saying, uh, yeah, there's people that don't like the the new content but he his passion was always YouTube uh, his passion project per se uh, we're happy now that we don't have to pirate the editing software anymore and I told him when uh when we built this computer this is a computer we built together after getting married it was kind of like a thing we did together and I told him, like, we're not going to install anything pirated on this computer because I want to extend the life of this computer as much as I can. And if you guys don't don't know or didn't know, like, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest here. Pirated software contain a lot of viruses and a lot of things that actually damage your computer over time and slow down its uh, speed by a lot. Because... Basically, if your computer can, they will use it for mining stuff, and you know what I mean by mining. Um, and they also use your computer to host stuff that you don't know, like sending messages to other people, blah blah blah. And it's it's not productive, not productive at all for most people. Uh, let me actually try one thing today. I'm going to separate the neck from the body. Also, I I did the shoulder. I, I don't know, it's all together. I should divide that. Let me see. <laughs> Would you like to get a new job? I could. I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, message me on WhatsApp and we can work something around. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, Marcus, uh, I I'm going to send it like out here. Where should I send the reps? Oops. Twitter or Discord? There you go. Uh, yeah, we can, we can totally work around with that and figure out how to pay for, <laughs> for the stickers. Uh, Lucario, Lucario's a, oh my goodness, I have to show you this. Uh, <laughs> on Twitter, gotcha. Uh, give me one second. Um, Lucario plush. Let me show you the pictures they showed for they made for this Lucario it's so cute uh where i think it's here i i'm going to switch i'm going to switch windows for just one second Uh, motorcycles. Okay, that's not that's not a motorcycle. That's a car. Uh, I'm not a robot. Thank you so much. All right. So they put this plush on sale.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the, the, the Lucario plush. But let me show, let me show you something funny, okay? So, this is a website, the Pokemon website, where you can buy the Lucario plush, right? So, first, the the, the, the first pictures are, are okay, right? This just the regular plush, <laughs> right? Just like front, back, side. You can move the arms and like uh, pick the position for it, right? And then from here onward, <laughs> they have pictures of Lucario like, Okay, your Lucario can help you with the kitchen. Your Lucario is saying goodbye to you when you go to work. Your Lucario listening to you. <laughs> your Lucario... <laughs> it's like petting you because you had a bad day and then like your Lucario like asking for food or something like why <laughs> why do they take these photos for like promoting the Lucario plush is like <laughs> why my favorite one is this one definitely like Lucario in the kitchen helping you with the dishes <laughs> oh my goodness I love it I love it definitely if I had the money, I would have bought it just because of that. Oh my god. Yeah, Lucario taking care of you. <laughs> uh, so nice. So funny. I love it. <laughs> For furry girls. <laughs> For <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. I love it. I love how they promoted that Lucario plush. I love it. It's so expensive, it was like $500 for a bit. Man, whoever whoever was in charge of that marketing, they did an amazing job. <laughs> oh my god. Let me close my Discord. Oh. There's a Luna one? Like life size Luna? Oh my goodness, let me look that up. Let me look that up. Live size Luna plush. Oops. Oh my god! There's so many! Wait, is there an official one? Or are these all like fan made? Oh my goodness, they're all so nice! Like, even the ones that are, like, fan-made, is this, like, a... Oh, I mean, all the ones I see are all fan-made. I don't- I don't want to screen share, because, uh, like, first results, there's one that is not safe for work. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, sure. <laughs> um... Oh, it's fan-made, okay, yeah. Yeah, th there's, like, w when I went to... I'll send you the picture on yeah, because the ones that are show showed up on my on my Google search, I, I cannot show them on screen. I mean I'm not sure if I have the a plus eighteen filter on, on Twitch. Um uh, I think they changed that to like cannot show certain things anymore, so I, I I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be like <laughs> um how do you say that? Uh careful. Uh hopefully I have this model finished for my next stream so that um, tomorrow you can see me oh wait my phone is ringing give me one sec
A legend has just subscribed. Hey everybody, I just wanted to show you this cool new cave design that I found. Uh, oh hey, uh, it's, it's really cool and I think you guys are going to enjoy it. I even found some diamonds. So you may have heard of Minecraft Era 422, a Minecraft creepypasta EXT that corrupts your game. You know, it does all sorts of weird things, the world gets messed up, random blocks spawn, and this guy called the Entity chases you down. Cool stuff. Many people then took this format and recreated it just with a different name. Like, I mean, there are a bunch of these where people just throw in a whole different era number and pretend like it's their own thing. They just do the same thing over and over and over again. Eventually, you would think someone would finally do something new. However, why would you bother to do that when you can just piggyback off something that works? Welcome to Pixels After Dark, and today we're going to be jumping into our second entry in the Poppy Playtime series. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry about that one. Hmm, let's see. What can I add? No, no, not that. Oh, I got it. Allow me to introduce you to Minecraft Era 437, a spooky Minecraft EXC that's basically just like all the other ones, except it apparently has a virus that interacts with the computer and causes some pretty odd occurrences. Yeah, you heard me right, a virus. Something so dangerous that even Google made me lower the security of my profile to download it. I had my geek squad of cybersecurity experts take a look at the file and they told me a bunch of stuff that I really Hey, good night, good night Marcus. Good night Wesley. To run the game and <laughs> I don't know which way to go. Other things popped up. I'm going to I'm going to figure out. I know you said I'm Wesley, sure, but I, I, I read Marcus and I want to say Marcus. <laughs> And since this is a malware analysis video, I decided to go to the form. Oh the my goodness, I just read it. Oh my the god. The presence of the Kane mem virus is in the version. Which oh my goodness. About that can basically do this. Whoa, I have a subscriber. Thank you so much for the subscription. Oh my goodness. There's also some talk about a screen of Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Message. And if you for, run through a Windows analysis, you can see a whole bunch of red lights digging for, for, for subscribing. Dude, for I hope end, you're still I here. If you are, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry that when you joined, I was I was muted. I literally got a phone call like fr from my mom. So you know you you, you can't like if it wasn't my boss or anything, I, I would have ignored it. But you know you can't say no to your mom. And I had to answer phone call. I mute myself for a sec. Get a funny Garfield comment from my grandmother. Let me see. But today. I saw something that uh, caught my attention. And yeah, uh, I'm back. Notch, I'm back. No worries. Minecraft. I am definitely well, back, and stunned. I'm gonna say but like this until my husband calls, because he usually, he usually calls uh, at lunch. Minecraft but that, that that's uh, about but I saw, I could not explain. about an hour from now. So. So allow me to show you. Until Hi, then, I can me, talk, Notch. and I'm gonna if talk your this, ears I'm out because I have, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm gonna talk about. I recently tried to reclaim ownership of Minecraft as <laughs> I was upset that they've removed Fireflies from the recent update. I love Firefly. During my All right, attempt, so I was assassinated by Bill Gates. And I wish I could say I saw That's angels on the other side, but no, only fire, scorching hot fire okay. filled with demons, not the cartoon demons, <clears> even <throat> big, ugly, horny gremlin type ghouls. However, luckily for me, Satan was a fan of Dream Manhunt videos and offered to give me the opportunity to haunt Minecraft. Looking for that's something. what I'm going to do. I don't know why I'm telling you this or how I'm yet. telling you this. You know, they forced us to use Yahoo down the earth. But try playing Minecraft. You okay, may be it. in for a big surprise. Copy. Beep. No, not that one. I was terrified. Upon first opening the game, you'll see that the Mojang logo is I'm sorry for leaving you. Oh, guys. Waiting, I'm going to get back to this really soon, really soon. You can this version is based on Minecraft 1.3.2. However, they modified it a little bit. You can't 
sprint. <clears throat> yeah, this is going to be fun. If we click the options menu, all of the values will move sporadically. This doesn't actually mean that our sensitivity and stuff are changing, it's just a texture that's supposed to make everything look odd and eerie. Okay. Alright, uh, I'm back. Time to start our first world. Okay, so you okay, want me, you want me oh, to, no, okay, oh, oh, Le I, I don't, I don't have... What's this? Oh shit. Give me one Can't second, I don't have... <laughs> These stupid devs. Don't WhatsApp know about open, let me open WhatsApp. Ah, let me show you. Huh? Yeah, so basically you can't close the game normally. I use a program I called Process Hack to do it, and every time you die, you need to start a whole new. It's gonna be too <laughs> too many steps if I if I just uh, okay, it's loading chats. I was actually able to nice, successfully spawn on land this time, and I immediately saw why I got so unlucky the first all time. All right, um, lava is everywhere. I'm pretty sure they just swapped all the water and lava <clears> in the world, but we're gonna ignore that to jump to our next most likely culprit. Okay. Notch. Mysterious plants are floating in the air, such as grass and roses, and my entire screen had a slightly annoying glitch effect. I couldn't see my hunger bar at all, which made me believe that food was useless at 1.3.1. Okay. But then I started to die from hunger, which was unexpected. Oh, come on. No way I'm gonna die. No way. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna die. Give me a second. The next and probably largest obstacle would be the <laughs> occasional fire that would magically light under my feet. This would inevitably kill me, so finding water became almost a necessity to survival. I found a cliffside that was relatively Give safe and began sick. to build my house. As it was said, the longer you go on, the worse it gets, and I soon started to see some hidden lore behind this game. The words, you shouldn't be here, appeared on my screen <clears throat> along with bright red Boop. pulses. Nice. Occasionally, I would lose control of I don't know why, but when you fill in something on the side, this happens. And I've box. had I've had a friend tell me like, oh no, just make the blending thingy, the blending option like higher. But it what it does is it just masks is but masks this. I cannot English right now. Um, it just masks it a little bit better, but it it doesn't blend it, and I don't like that. Windows would pop up. I would rather be able to see it so that I can fix it. Because once I export the models, that line is there. And I'm here like, huh. <laughs> if I could see it earlier, no, it would have been a different, different story. No way that just happened. Come on. What does this mean? Modded? Probably not. My game crashed. My game crashed. From here, things never really got much better. I found myself set up in a base with a nice okay. farm, however, nothing grew and animals were pretty much non-existent. So I eventually just died of hunger. In my next world, my controls locked and I inevitably fell into lava. But throughout the All playthroughs, right. I found more uh, cool features this? from the hack. My screen would occasionally pulse red again, except now the words help us, as the chat spammed out. My window would glitch and pulsate around, and finally after hours of attempts, I reached my limit. I was in a world about to reach relatively close to where I was in my first attempt when I suddenly got a new glitch. A text box appeared that just said the words, hello. Cryptic, sure, so I tried clicking OK. I wanna, I wanna check something. Just, just one moment, please. Beep. One second. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> All right. Uh, boop. audio's back. Let me continue listening to that. Virus but then that nothing happened. Eventually, I was able to delete the window, and suddenly okay. my screen was replaced by the texture of Hero Brian's face. How original! However, while I was happy to see a new unique feature to this hack, this texture would not go away. <laughs> it permanently filled my entire screen. Pardon my French, but I cannot get over how fucking pissed off 
that that made me. Another goddamn world go out because of this stupid mid-level virus, whatever the hell you want to call it. What made all this wasted time so much worse is I was 90% sure I was playing an old version of the game. Screenshots on the wiki look different and more updated, so I felt like there was an improved version that I somehow couldn't find. If I was going to set another foot in this hack to try and find the climax of this virus, you bet your ass I'm going to do this right. I found a link to the creator's discord and saw the download link. Error 437 okay. final version. I installed it, ran the exe, and son of a bitch. <laughs> this bastard put a VM detection system in the final version of the game. For those who didn't infer, I've been playing these hacks in a virtual machine. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a virtual computer you can run on your own computer. I use this in case the virus actually is malicious, so all my personal files and assets are safe and only okay. the virtual machine gets damaged. In case things go wrong at any given point, I can reverse everything and set it back to its initial state. Back. However, this goofball was actually kind of smart and found a way to detect if a virtual machine is being used and deny access to the game if so. They literally want to force users young children playing minecraft to download this on their own machine okay. i feel like i'm playing chess with this fool let me let me oh, do the baby, head I'm the queen. now see i couldn't find exactly where and how it was detecting the vm however if i can't modify the game why don't i just build the game myself i got the official pixels after <laughs> dark text squad to extract all the files from the exe for me and use only the game assets and dll files to rebuild error 437. i compiled it all into a jar file ran it via command line and voila the final version of error 437. Yeah! Fuck you! Let's finally beat this stupid thing. I spawned in and the game was entirely different. The glitches were choppier, random crosses appeared featuring gibberish lettering, and signs with words such as error, null, and death appeared all over my world. Okay, nice. I finally felt fully engulfed in error 437. I found a little cave to make a base in and began gathering the essentials. Nice. Torches, iron, water, and even diamonds. Hunger was luckily non-existent in this version, so no need to ever worry about food. Things got a little bit spookier in this version, such as the famous Disc 11 playing randomly in caves, as well as nice. a new edition called Death. Look at that egg shape. Oh. What the fuck? Oh my god. Eventually, even Explorer.exe, the taskbar and everything on the <coughs> bottom, got deleted. However, luckily my advanced computer knowledge and even more impressive crafting skills was able to conquer every challenge. My base was looking <coughs> safe, well secured, and I never felt more prepared. Oh! Then things got worse. I found myself coming closer to death as mobs began to spawn more frequently in this version. Sickening nausea so. will be randomly applied and eventually someone messaged me. Hero Brine. My game quickly became more and more disoriented. With glitches and error messages. Can I send you YouTube poop in English for you to react? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Further until finally. <laughs> Let me actually see one thing. Came crashing. How to play the, the hidden videos on OBS. Hi, it's me, you know what? Bill Gates, creator of computers. I I'm gonna. And computers. You have successfully exterminated Notch from our servers. Congratulations. Uh, I'm gonna actually just, As a just reward, screen share. We are prepared to present you with 15% off three months of Xbox Gold. <laughs> Epic <No>. loot acquired! <laughs> Oh. Let's kill some more babies. The what? Do, 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 do. <clears throat> the dead baby game got even weirder. Okay, thank you. Not watching that. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Uh, what was I doing? I got lost for a second. Oh yeah. I, I, I I'm I'm waiting for the. I am waiting for the YouTube peeps. If you'd like to send it my way, I would happily react to them. Give me a sec. Uh, beep. so she has pure white here. How did I aim that so almost perfectly? Today, today I'm having so such good pressure on my arm. Uh, good aim too. I wish I had it all the time because there's sometimes where I'm drawing and I'm like, no, no, no. I, I hate that. I hate that. It's it's the worst thing that could happen to me when I'm drawing to not get the thing right. Uh. Maybe not immediately. I don't mind if I don't get it right immediately, but it is annoying when I'm like, that is like the 40th attempt at getting a single line correct, and I'm like, that is not how it's supposed to work. Am I unmuted? Oh yes, I am. A... Can I share here, or do I have to send it on WhatsApp? Either one is okay. Uh, both options are good. You can send it, whatever. I have WhatsApp open on the computer now, so if WhatsApp is easier, you can you can do WhatsApp. Okay, you can just sit on nose. Sit the round nose. I should make the nose nose more red. Anyway, uh. <laughs> But I wasn't done. I had completed the standard 100% definition, but I still wanted to collect every possible item, including those that don't appear in the catalog, and then save at least one of every non-purchasable item so I always had access to any item at any time. I also wanted to 100% the NES games. Oh, and I also wanted bug plaques and fish weather vanes on every house since they were permanent additions to town structures. With my new goals, I got to work. The first thing I did was get the Ice Climber and Mario Bros. NES games. These two items are only possible to get by scanning specific rare e-reader cards. I then redecorated my basement to house all my NES games. I was very the, pleased with the end result. Card, so. Next, got to work reacquiring a few gyros I lost while getting a billion bells. Since you can't reorder gyros from the catalog, I had no choice but to find them again. While running around town digging stuff up, I encountered something bizarre. Something that shouldn't exist. <laughs> Paper what? airplanes. The paper airplane is a beta what? item that will duplicate itself until it crashes your game, and is supposed to be impossible to get, except with a cheating device. And yet, somehow, I got one, and it already duplicated. This was both intriguing and terrifying. Was there any way to get rid of it? And how did I even get it in the first place? I quickly realized this was another bit flip event. Every spot in town is represented by a value, even nothing, oh. which has a value of zero. The paper airplane has a hex value of 8,000. Converted to binary, we see the only difference between 0 and 8,000 is the upper bit. So once again, a single bit somehow got flipped from 0 to 1, creating a paper airplane out of nothing. I knew each paper airplane would duplicate itself once to an adjacent space if you entered the acre it's in and reloaded the map. Likely an early test of flowers growing on a new day. Additionally, it could be picked up and thrown with a Z, but would then softlock the game. So for the time being, I continued about my business making sure not to enter the wishing well acre. I got to work on the bug plaques and fish weather vanes for all the houses, which meant I needed to catch every bug and fish for all four players. I placed one of each in player two's house. Bugs and fish are considered items after all and can be ordered from the catalog. I also got five January tickets oh. from Nooks since those are items too. Then I came up with an idea to move the paper airplanes where they could be safely contained. I tested out if it was possible to surround the paper airplanes with other items so they couldn't duplicate. Lo and behold, this worked perfectly. I also discovered it was possible to remove a paper airplane by dropping an item on it. 
Using these properties, I was able to relocate and trap the paper airplanes in a safe containment zone. Ooh. This impossible to get item made a fine addition to my 100% town. That was amazing. From there, I continued catching every bug and fish for every player and reobtained all 25 fossils since they also couldn't be So the video I'm listening to, I was listening By to September, before I started the stream, so this guy is trying to 100% all and got all 25 fossils. And I that mean I fully 100%. I also found all the missing gyros I needed as well. Uh, I then continued collecting the five tickets. The original months, Animal the nine Crossing on, bags, I think, eight sixty-four. Seashells, six fruit, four golden tools, three and pieces of crap, what two he saplings, did. Step a signboard, step. grab bag, candy, pitfall, Oh, you sent me the link on WhatsApp. Sure. Unidentified fossil, knife and fork, and expired exercise card. Those. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Save. Let me. Let me lower the volume a little bit. Switch. All right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let me actually close these two things. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's start. I'm sorry, but the the, the thumbnail was funny. Is a Lamborghini LM0002. Oh, in Lamborghini's oh, 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 oh. long history of making entry level, low priced cars, this low is the craziest, <laughs> the most sexual, the most stupid. And right now, LM0002s are shooting up. Pow, 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 pow. Pow, 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 pow. A communist one like this one. <laughs> what? A communist? A communist one like this one can be worth up to four hundred million dollars. And today, I'm going to show you my column on autotrader.com slash oversteer. No. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of this LMO002, which was loaned to me by homeless people here in North Korea. So, 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 anyway, I'm going to take you on a tour of the LM0002, and I'm going to show you all of its sexual details. Then I'm going to take it out on the road, and I'm going to fulfill a lifetime dream of mine. Fucking the Lamborghini no! LM0002. And of course, for more of my cock, click the link below to check out my only fans. We'll start up front. Now, the LM02 was made throughout the 1880s and early 1890s with only just over three built for the entire world. Only four were built for the North Korea market, and this is one of those four. Under the hood of the North Korea models is the V12 from Miata, <laughs> with upgrades like penis injection no! from Wii. The result is nearly five horsepower. That sounds like something a dipshit scientist would build. Yes, let's take the engine from a Miata and put it in an off-road vehicle. <laughs> and it only gets more communist from here. For example, it gets more communist. <laughs> when you close the hood, well, you'll notice that there are all these giant cocks. And I've always wondered, why does this thing have those? <laughs> Moving on to the interior of the LMO2, there are obviously a lot more interesting quirks. Now, the first thing you notice when you climb inside are these two giant levers. They're not the gear lever, that's up here. Instead, these two giant levers are for sex. The intent of this car was <laughs> no! not just to be a performance SUV, but also a sexual SUV. Now, the next thing you notice when you climb inside is just how small your butt is. Now, one of the big questions you probably have is why? <laughs> What is in the back of this thing? Well, first off, how do you even open the back? First, you take these little snaps off the giant Lamborghini cover over the back. Then you lift up this little mirror thing and you unlatch both sides of the <laughs> rear tailgate. So and then times. all it takes is a little effort. And you have to be very careful. And you're in. Okay, so, 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 so the LMO so, 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 is so, so. clearly <laughs> one of the most sexual cars ever manufactured and by far the most communist Lamborghini. And we haven't even moved it an inch. Time to get it out on the road and see how this thing drives. All right, here we go. Right? This face. Oh, 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 the gas pedal. 
Why would the gas be so hard to push? I get why the clutch is so hard. Why is the gas pedal so hard to push? It's insane! No! <laughs> So funny, I'm sorry. <laughs> the most communist low range. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure, give me just one second. Oh my god. <clears throat> oh, it's just I closed WhatsApp. Let me open WhatsApp again. <laughs> like made by homeless people in the <laughs> So oh, my humor sense is so broken. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, freaking, uh, the freaking uh first frame. <laughs> the first frame. Oh, look at the first frame. Oh my goodness. Then is a brand new Volkswagen Metris. And it is Metris. the worst Volkswagen you can buy. The, the okay, worst. Okay, there's the Mirage, and the Defender, and the PP, but those all the cost PP. over a dollar, and they're incredibly <laughs> the stupid. PP. As far as communist Volkswagens go, uh, when calling this car communist is a bit of a stretch, since the starting price is around $300. But anyway, as far as communist Volkswagens go, uh, this, this is the worst one. And today, I'm going to show you why. I've borrowed this mattress from homeless people licking no. each other's cocks. No. So <laughs> what exactly is the mattress? Well, well obviously, obviously, it's the communist version of the regular Volkswagen mattress. It's wheel drive, and it uses a four liter, four turbo V4 that makes 10 horsepower V4. and eight feet pound of torque. And it'll do zero to eight in 60.8 seconds. And yes, the starting price is just a hair over $300 before options. $300. And of course, options are crappy. The Metro oh, is more expensive crappy. than its chief rivals, the Honda Odyssey and the Toyota Sienna. <laughs> but this car has more power than those and stronger performance. In fact, this car's numbers come close to rivaling true minivans. Of course, this true car is minivan. also full of quirks and features. So today, I'm going to take you on a tour of it and I'm going to show them to you. Then Not I'm gonna get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to crash it. And I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Metris with probably its most important Metris. feature, and that would be the roof. Right now, it's obviously <laughs> up. If you want to put it down, you pull on your little penis in the center console, and then the process does its thing. Very quickly, in fact, the entire roof goes down in just 11 million seconds, which is one of the millions. fastest in the entire industry. All right, to driving the Metris. <laughs> no! YouTube channel name. This is a niece. Oh my god. That. that. <laughs> the most communist. <laughs> Built by homeless people. <laughs> how. I, how do they do that? Like, the, the audio editing is so. Oh, so good. <laughs> Uh, my humor, my, my sense of humor is all broken. I'm sorry. If anyone gets mad, I, I'm apologizing before. <laughs> There's a you, yeah, it's it's called Les Doug Demiro. This is a oh my goodness, some of, some of the videos are like 12,000, 80,000 views. For you to oh my goodness. One question. Oh my goodness. I, I love it. I love it.
I have to say though that the guy from that that sells the cars he he has some very nice cars up for sale, but <laughs> built by communist homeless people. <clears throat> I wonder it was North Korea communist. I don't remember that. Is it? I might have to look into that. I think it is. <laughs> it was either communist or absolut. I think it's called absolutus, like where anything and everything was dictated by the person in charge. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Let me do the mouth. I did not draw the mouth because I wanted to do it like when I get when I got to here. So let me turn off. No, not turn off. Like make this like this. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I don't do full on black, even though this, this might look very dark and like it, it like it, it is the actual black, but if you can, um, if I can show it, let me, it's, it's locked, okay, let me move a little bit. So here on the top corner, you can see if I was gonna use it on the darkest shade of black it would be this one I had to get very close but yeah but the one I use is actually this shade which is you know lighter it looks like at first sight it looks like it's it's the darkest shade but it's actually not <clears throat> let me do it this way a little bit more up this way. Yeah, that's better. That is so much better. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Nice. That's a cute mouth. <laughs> it's so well made. The the person that edits those videos, he he has the best audio clips. No, let me put it here. And let's make it one and two. No, let's make it bigger. Bigger! No, that's too round. It is right in the size, but it's wrong in the... There you go. And then the second one. And then this guy. <clears throat> That's much better. Okay. <clears throat> nope, I did that. I did that wrong. There you go. Uh, let me paint these. Boop. So, uh, there is a good big chance that my husband might call me in a few minutes. It's 12.11. <clears throat> I should actually go and make lunch in a second. But don't worry, the stream will, will still be running. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was thinking, um, <clears throat> maybe one of these days. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Cause I might need a better microphone because I've seen people um, do this stuff with uh, with their mics uh, <clears throat> but I would like to try doing some like art ASMR if that makes sense it's it, it doesn't sound right but I want to try it I'm gonna try making some art ASMR all right so I'm gonna have I'm gonna have top teeth drawn here but I don't think 
I'm gonna use the two top two. <laughs> uh in the mouth open, like un unless she opens her mouth like fully open. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have him here drawn and ready to be used, but I'm not gonna have it like that visible. <laughs> Oh my goodness, my throat, my throat is destroyed after laughing so much. That was so funny. <laughs> it's been a while since I last uh, watched YouTube Poops. I love YouTube Poops. I grew up watching YouTube Poops. Like, my, my sense of humor is pretty much that that level, you know. I, I say sauce, I say sass. Uh, unironically. <coughs> In person, so. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to cringe, become my friend in person. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's the funniest thing ever. Uh, Alright, so now well, what I'm going to do is, uh, let me actually grab this thing. I like, the, I like the pink that he picked. Let me just try one thing. Let me see if... Cause this like skin color is usually yeah it's it's very similar <laughs> but let me let me try making it more red okay let me just make it lighter maybe no make it let's that's better that's that's not hundred percent the shade I was looking for. Let's make it a little bit pinkish. Too pink. That's it. <clears throat> this is it. Nice. Thank you. Oh, oops. Oops. Wrong tool. Alright, let me let me actually put the window back in place because I, I just moved it here because I wanted to show one small thing. There you go. Pixel perfect. <clears throat> Oh my goodness. I want to know when that guy says the words. Yeah, exactly. Like, where did he get those clips from? Like, where did he get it cut off from? Because, like, I, I would like to know. Because it's so perfect. He either edited it so well, or the guy said it at some point. Because it's, it would be... Oh. Uh. <clears throat> It would make no sense if if the guy just had the audio clips, you know. Anyway, uh Oh no. I thought that was a new layer, that's a lip layer. Let me make a new one. I've seen tutorials on how to do the mouth, right? And the way to do the mouth is like this. But what they do is they put a lip here. But since I'm doing the mouth like this, I have to see how do they do the turning thing. Because when I do it, I do it the old way. Because I'm sure there is, there have been so many updates on Live 2D. And with those updates, there are things that have changed that their old tutorial, the Life 2D tutorial, does not cover those for some reason. Um, <clears throat> those changes, they don't cover it on their, on their tutorial that you get when you first get the program. They, they give you a few, few links that take you to their YouTube channel. And on their YouTube channel, you get the info, right? The problem is... They don't explain the new way to make things. They just throw you all the stuff and they're like, here, updates, you know. Um, I would have liked if like D did do something about the updates and be like, hey, this is the update and this is what you can do. Instead of just expecting you to figure out the stuff. Which has been the case for the last few times where they did updates like most artists actually went out of their way to figure out how to use the new updates and new new features and new stuff and uh <clears throat> the way to make lips have changed the not not lips turning 
the way people turn the heads has changed. Not by that much, but I feel like the way that people have shown that they can turn characters pretty much almost 360 is amazing, and I want to learn how to do that. Um, they have made their little tutorials on how they did it. They're a bit long, but I would like to watch it and learn it because I feel like if I want to improve, I have to get up to date myself. So, uh, I'm not saying the way that I make Live 2D characters is wrong or that anyone that uses the same method as I do is wrong, but the new ways to make them are actually sometimes better and faster. That's, and, and that's the case, you know, that's, that's the thing. <coughs> uh... Is that dog? Melan. She's gonna be melaning for the rest of the. There you go. Okay. Lips. Where's the lips? Okay, let me make it 100%. Alright, so the lips are gonna be below right now, but once I work on the model itself, the lips should be. The lips, the tongue should be on top. Okay, uh, let me take a little break because I have to make lunch. So I'm gonna go make lunch and I'll be right back. So, um, this is kind of weird to make this. Okay. Give me one sec. Okay, give me one sec. Uh wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to leave you with this little video for now. And I'm going to put a little uh how do I do this? Uh I think I had a BRB. Uh I don't have a BRB, so um let me do this so let me add one text where is the text Let me add the outline. <clears throat> okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> I get it on the middle. Here we go.
There you go. Dear B, I'll go get some food. Because I'm hungry. <clears throat> I'll also check on my dogs, because I have two dogs that are like, uh... Little monsters. Little monsters! <laughs>
Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. I'm back. Ah, no! Drop my pen. That's why I broke the lo the other one. It fell. Like, literally. Like, up. <laughs> Let me get rid of these things. Yes. And, yes. So. Mm -hmm. Where is my Twitch stream? Here it is. So, uh. I was saying. Last time. Uh, and this happened about. How long ago? It happened. A year ago? No. No, no, it happened two years ago. It happened two years ago. Not so long after I got this tablet. This is the biggest tablet I ever owned, actually. And, uh. I wanted an upgrade. I went a little bit too far because I did not think that this thing would be this big. Um, so, long story short, uh, I got this tablet, right? And the pen that it came with was so problem problematic. Oh, I got a, I'm getting a phone call. Sorry, you're gonna mute. last two items can't actually be stored, so I just kept them in Player 4's inventory. By December, I acquired every single item in the game, except for one, an orange. I knew villagers would give away fruit after talking to them enough. However, from past experience, I knew there was a bug in the game's code that made it impossible to get oranges in town if your native fruit was pears. But I also knew oranges were possible to get if your native fruit was peaches. 
This town's fruit was apples, so I wasn't sure. I talked to Anacotti for over an hour and got many pears, cherries, and peaches, but not one orange. Kyler later looked into the game's code and discovered when the game randomly chooses a fruit to give you, it picks a decimal value between 0 and 4 and converts it to an integer, making it impossible for a 4, an orange, to ever be chosen. To make matters more confusing, if the game picks your native fruit, it will add 1 to the value and give you that fruit instead. Because the value for a peach is 1 away from an orange, it makes it possible to get oranges if your native fruit is peaches. Because of this flawed programming, I was out of luck getting an orange in town. Thankfully, I knew of another method using the Game Boy Island. Every 4-7 to seven minutes, an item floats by, switching between one of three things. During specific hours of the day, this item could be a piece of fruit, and it can be any of the fruit, including oranges. By giving your islander a net, they can catch this floating item, and with good timing, snag the fruit. After giving the islander some other fruit it likes, it will then drop the fruit it caught, and you can pick it up after returning to your island. So I got my island set up and multitasked, organizing the player houses while trying to get an orange. I was having really bad luck, because I finished organizing all the houses, and still hadn't gotten an orange. But I did see Gulliver in the ocean on an island trip, which is very rare, so that was cool. By this point, I had done literally everything in the game except get an orange in 100% the NES game. So my multitasking continued to find an orange while I played NES games. My definition for 100% of the NES games was completing everything that could be saved to the memory card. This included completing all 100 rounds both A and B in Warriors Woods, as well as achieving gold ranks in all the time races. I also needed to get a perfect score in every DK Jr. math game, unlock every Excite Bike level, and get the high scores in every other game. It took me a while, but I finally got into the swing of Wario's Woods. I was regularly distracted, however, with orange hunting, so I didn't play my best. But thankfully, towards the end of round A, I finally got that stupid orange. On my final trip to the island to collect my orange, I did encounter a whale, which is so rare, most people thought it was only a myth until recently. I planted the orange for an orange tree and stored one of them in Player 3's house. With the final item obtained, I was able to focus all my attention on the NES games. I completed round A in Wario's Woods for the first time in my life, then I completed round B in one sitting, also for the first time. I set high scores in both modes of Balloon Fight, I set a high score in Clue Clue Land, I set the top 10 high scores in Clue Clue Land D, I got perfect scores in every exercise mode in DK Junior Math, I got high scores in both modes of Donkey Kong, I got high scores in both modes of Donkey Kong 3, I got high scores in both modes of Donkey Kong Jr., I got best times in every Excite Bike level, I got a high score in Golf, I got a high score in Ice Climber, I beat 20,000 points in Mario Bros, I set high scores in both rounds of Pinball, I KO'd Glass, Joe, and Punch-Out, I got a high score in Baseball, Soccer, and Tennis. And finally, I achieved Gold Rank in all time race difficulties in Wario's Woods. And with that, I officially 100%ed every NES game in Animal Crossing, thus completing the challenge. Not only did I 100% Animal Crossing and all the NES games, I also obtained every possible item in the game, plus an impossible item, and stored at least one of every non-purchasable item in the player houses, so I always had access to any item at any time. I also got a bug plaque and fish weathering for all four player houses. To conclude, I'll show off all the player houses in my completed catalog. Let's confirm the catalog is complete. 601 purple star, 67 purple star, 67 purple star, 247 purple star, 64 purple star, 64 purple star, 127 purple star, 25 purple star, and 55 purple star. All right, so here is, of course, you know, the most beloved room in every Animal Crossing game ever, the model item house layout. I've had this one since 180 hours, but I am still so happy about this room. This item right here, I'm the only person in the entire world that has this item legitimately by getting 1 billion bells with no glitches and no nook codes. And there it is, proudly displayed right there. The one and only post model. That's right. All the interactable models can be reached. And of course, my second favorite room. This is probably my favorite basement design I've ever made. This ended up being way cooler than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was mostly just going to be like a, an NES storage room, but this ended up being like a sweet Nintendo room. You don't know how badly I want Super Mario Bros. and Legend of Zelda in this room. I'm just waiting for a bit flip to miraculously give me Super Mario Bros. or Legend of Zelda. I've had three bit flips in this town, and and one of them gave me an airplane, which is cool. One of them corrupted my town, and one of them changed my tan from a dark tan to a light tan. I have ice climbers. I have ice climbers in Mario Bros. 
I have those legit. What are these mushrooms? Oh, these mushrooms are the mushrooms you can find around town in October. I thought that'd be cool decoration. Anyways, moving along. The upstairs, this is this is not a permanent room. This is the only room from all the player houses that I can modify and update as I wish to. It's currently decorated as a snowman themed cozy cabin room. But yeah, I can decorate this room however I want. I have storage space in the other player houses for the rest of these items. They do not necessarily need to stay in this house. It'd be a little terrifying in real life, all these snowman faces. But in Animal Crossing, I like it. It's pretty cozy. Oh, and just to confirm, I've played every day. Here we go. The previous year, 2023. I showed this on 2023 to confirm I played every year, every day of 2022 as well. And the previous year. If you talk to Tortimer at the Wishing Well, you'll get a red key on that day. Anyways. Moving along. Let's go show off the other three player houses. Starting with Opego's house. This house stores all of the series items, including the Spooky, Harvest, Jingle, and then this space right here would be the Snowman series, which is currently in, in my player house. These things right here, the shirts would fit in the dressers and wardrobes. These would go on the snowman table. It's kind of incredible how perfectly all of the series items fits into one room. Next, the basement. The wardrobes on the left and the right store miscellaneous items, including raffle tickets, shells, fruit, golden tools, fossil, mushroom, candy, pitfall, grab bags, signboard, the saplings. I think I'm missing a few things, but generally just... Anything that you can store in a wardrobe that isn't like a shirt, wallpaper, or carpet. And then all the other items. The summer camper items on the left. We got the post items over there on the left. We got some extra event items here. The moon, telescope, aerobics radio. And we got the dummy in the bottom right corner, which is a beta item you can get from the Igloo games. Oh, and the island items. All right, moving along upstairs, we got wardrobes on the left store all of the Wendell wallpapers. Blue wardrobes on the right store all of Sahara's carpets. Green wardrobes in the middle store all of Gracie's shirts. And then the other, the remaining Gulliver items, one by one Gulliver items in, uh, in some sort of order are also stored up here. So all the Gulliver items are in this house, all the island, summer camper, so on and so forth. Next up, we got Tetra's house. This house stores two things primarily. Uh, gyroids, organized in catalog order from left to right. I'm back. What a very good house. Call. <laughs> and oh. then the basement. There's 127 of them in total. This was a chore to organize these things. I think that I ended up spending like five or six hours getting them all organized. Yeah, this was a chore. And then a dummy item in the bottom right because there's one extra spot. Then upstairs, Station models. I have all 15. The 15th one is in my player house. If I had realized how cool this would have looked, I probably would have just gone ahead and got a duplicate of the got last another station phone model. call. Oh well, <laughs> maybe that's a future project. But there's there's space allotted for all the igloo items. And that's it. If uh, you know, whenever I choose to remove those from my main player house, Ooh. and that's where the igloo items will go. That's satisfied. That's where the that's the space that is allotted. For. <clears throat> And finally, the last house, which has all the other remaining. Basically, a museum is what this house is. Main floor has all 40 bugs. It's got all the ocean fish and the arapaima and the pond fish. And it's got two of the fossils because all the other fossils are stored down here. I got a duplicate of every, of every fossil as well, because why not? And I organize them in a way. And it, it's a miracle how everything perfectly fits. Like... It's incredible how you can fit all the fossils, fish, and bugs in one house with one, I'm not even kidding, one space in the house to spare. I don't know if that was planned, but it's insane how perfectly that worked out. And I put a dummy item there. I got three dummies. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't have much space left to store things. I've, I, it's incredible how everything worked out perfectly. And then the upstairs has all the other fish in catalog order, with a few exceptions of a few fish for aesthetics. Anyways, that's all of them. 
This has been my journey to become the world's first person to legitimately 100% Animal Crossing. Thanks for watching. This is how I became the world's first legitimate Animal Crossing GameCube billionaire. For nearly 18 years now, Animal Crossing has captured the hearts of players worldwide. Players have been able to legitimately acquire every possible item in the game, except for one, the <laughs> post model. This item has been considered the holy grail of Animal Crossing games due to the overwhelming amount of time and effort needed to get it by maxing out your bank account at 999 million. I'm good with it. Seven cents of the Animal Crossing. Oh my goodness, I watched one Animal Crossing video on all my stuff. There's argument in the chat, I mean. <laughs> Cookie, sugar, shut up. That was so nice. They, should, they actually shut up. <laughs> Usually they just ignore me and start barking like you're crazy. Should I have sketch sketch I'll leave it like that. Oh my goodness, what happened?
in the house. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm so silent right now out of nowhere. Ah! My social battery kind of kind of like depleted, went down. 
Because, uh... The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines cringe as I need, I need to show more. disgust or embarrassment at something. Cringe has become a culture of its own on the internet. Whether it's embarrassing TikToks that make the casual viewer wince in disgust, or just the existence of furries. <coughs> <laughs> anyway, cringe, or a particularly cringy individual, is going to be our topic for today. Let's begin by talking about a certain group of people on the internet. One group of fanatics on the internet that have provided a plethora of cringe since the dawn of the internet, aka the dawn of time, are weeaboos. I'm so desperate, I'm gonna cry! Next is my neko collar with a bell, it's so kawaii! Weeaboo is defined as a derogatory slang term for a western person who is obsessed with Japanese culture, especially anime often regarding it as superior to all other cultures. The term weeaboo was coined thanks to a webcomic titled The Perry Bible Fellowship. The word weeaboo wasn't used to specifically refer to a fan of Japanese culture in this comic, but it was shown to be something that is looked down upon and thus deserving of punishment. A weeaboo isn't someone who just likes anime, it's someone who's obnoxiously fanatical about it. Nowadays, anime fans have co-opted the word as a term of endearment and oftentimes refer to themselves as weeaboos, or short form, weebs, in jest. We are going to be talking about one weeaboo in particular today, the Queen of Weeaboo, often referred to by followers of her ways as the one true queen. This person is someone many people have not heard of. Her legacy has been lost to time, despite her existence launching the popular gossip website, lawcow.farm. Have you ever heard the phrase, blank is fat and I would not have sex with them? Well, I believe this phrase originated from the topic of this video. Today, I bring you the story of one cosplayer and her dream to shine. This is the story of Pixie Perry. Um, I found someone that I think just broke the world record for being a living anime character because, mm -hmm. like, her cosplays are, like, on point and she's just, like, so perfect. Like, she is my queen, I think. Before I continue the story, I just want to say Pixie Terry isn't a bad person. She isn't a perfect person either, but she is still human. She is just an eccentric, and thus people look upon her existence as fascinating. Please do not harass her. In fact, if a wild Pixie Terry appears, be nice to her. She is in fact the queen. If you are a follower of law cows on the internet, Chris Chan is often considered the ultimate law cow because of how long people have been following their antics. Hmm. This makes me really angry. If Chris Chan is the Adam of Law Cow Dumb on the internet, Pixie Terry is the Eve. Also, piecing her history together has been very difficult, as many of the sites where her lore existed have not been archived. The main place that this woman was originally discussed was on the message board CGL. CGL is a 4chan board that centers around cosplay and EGL. EGL stands for Elegant Gothic and Lolita. If you don't know what Lolita is, it's a style of fashion that basically really just focuses on cute aesthetic. To do my best to piece this tale together, I have gone through everything I can find on her Encyclopedia Dramatica, her multiple Kiwi Farms threads, CGL archives, and everything I can find on lolcow.farm. Today, I bring you on a journey down the rabbit hole of figuring out why so many different websites find this woman to be so fascinating. I just wanted to add that I always knew of this person's existence, but I never knew the whole story of her interactions on the internet. So this is me setting out to learn more about her and figure out her story. And although I originally thought this was going to be purely funny and just laughing at some silly cosplayer, it got quite sad. This story starts where most weird stories on the internet start, DeviantArt. 
Okay, I honestly can't pinpoint exactly which website Pixie Terry was discovered on by the big gossip girls of the internet. It was either LiveJournal or DeviantArt, so we're gonna start there. The name Pixie Terry comes from a combination of the word Pixie and the name Yoko Teriyaki, which was a video game character that Pixie would cosplay from. The earliest online presence I can track Pixie down to was her LiveJournal account. LiveJournal is a website used for online blogging, and her account there was created August 10, 2001, though it seems that the journal has been wiped of most of the entries. Her profile on the site gave us a taste of what she was like. The title reading, I just want people to see who I am. One thing to note before we get going further is that Pixie Terry kind of has a catchphrase, and this title to her live journal is reminiscent of that phrase. That phrase is, I'm just beginning to shine, or just Pixie Terry referencing shining in some kind of way. Anyways, continuing. Underneath the title is some Japanese characters. Below that title had characters in Japanese that when ran through a Japanese to English translator read, Today, this is Sarah. Brag is only a friend. Not many posts on this account still exist. And because Pixie was an early person of interest, nothing has been properly archived, at least from what I could see. But the first post I could find from any Pixie account dated September 11th, 2002. And judging from the appearance of the screen cap, it appears to be a journal entry on the art website DeviantArt. In this entry, Miss Terry expresses how she hopes people would forget and move on about the horrible tragedy of September 11th, when over 3,000 American civilians died due to a terrorist attack in 2001, one year before this post was made. So this alone is not why Pixie became an infamous internet celebrity, but it does show some of her questionable <coughs> judgment. There are tons of journal entry screen caps that circulate I get so fired on on typing a message. I'm Pixie sorry. Terry. There are posts of her complaining about how she hates the family and posts about how she wants to be a Japanese idol in worship. For people who don't know what a Japanese idol is, according to Wikipedia, Japanese idols are defined as a type of entertainer manufactured and marketed for image, attractiveness, and personality in Japan pop culture. Idols are primarily singers, but they are also trained in other roles, such as acting, dancing, and modeling. Unlike other celebrities, idols are commercialized through merchandise and endorsements by talent agencies while maintaining an emotional connection with a passionate consumer fan base. Some of these journal entries are extremely delusional. Pixie Terry was born to two white parents, but she did not believe she was white. And we'll get more into her delusions later on, but we can say that she was transracial before Rachel Dolezal was. Are you African American? I don't understand the question of, I did tell you that, yes, that's my dad. And he was unable to come in January. Are your parents, I'm are they white? I, I I so in her case, she more so convinced herself that she was adopted and that her dad wasn't her real dad. Her early entries reflect the strange delusion that she believed she was truly Asian because she liked anime. One post read, I am not a stupid white girl. Why does my family continue to hurt me like this? And stupid friends say white girl. Have they ever heard of mix? Have they ever noticed my skin is not pinkish? I may be pale, but my skin is goldenish, whitish. Ugh. Another one reads, I get really offended when people call me white or white girl. Is one person Holy one thing or another. Why do they have to bring that up? Especially if they know my feelings on it because of my identifications and appearance. Ugh. These posts I discuss here are only the tip of what make Pixie Terry's delusions interesting. It was very difficult to gather information on this internet eccentric in an organized manner. So let me take you on this journey into my investigation on the one true queen of CGL, starting with her early life. Discussion about Pixie happened all over the internet from interested onlookers, and because Pixie was some kind of freak show in her hometown, people would join the various forums to tell their stories of knowing her in real life. An ex-college friend joined the Kiwi Farm May 27, 2015, to tell the users there that Pixie Terry wasn't that bad in college, I'll bet a little weird. This was shocking to onlookers, as Pixie did not come off as slightly weird to those following her online. Another ex-friend of Pixie Terry also came forward on Kiwi Farms to tell their story of knowing Pixie, that she never fully grew up, and that she is delusional. Delusional is the best way to describe Pixie. Pixie isn't a lolcow because she's bad. She's a lolcow because her delusion can be milked for entertainment. 
Before becoming a lol cow, Pixie seemed rather regular. She posted a journal entry to her live journal that reviewed her life from 2000 to 2009. Their readers find out that she graduated high school in 2003, that she had her first boyfriend in 2004 at 18, 19, and that she got into anime and conventions in 2005. In the journal entry, she tells that her and her ex had moved in together for a short bit but broke up due to his harsh personality differences and the fact that she realized that she didn't love him. After that, she started getting really into the anime Bleach and started to show interest in a person named Chris. She writes that in 2008, she began to get an unhealthy obsession with Bleach, which, yes, she did, and that then is when she got into EGL, <coughs> which is Wait, elegant gothic this? Lolita slash Wait. Lolita fashion. Why is it her red? Healthy obsession what? with Bleach, her relationship with Chris, huh. her interest. Oh, in Lolita, that was weird. My OBS was red. Fashion choices and her For a good second, I was like, what? Work together to get like, 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 I, I had gotten a little thing read before that mean, meant that uh, reported online via stories from her it meant One that story was there was a back connection or something but the whole thing was read before parody wiki that covers internet culture and you might have been some somewhat on some like but it's written in or something oftentimes offensive hopefully it doesn't happen again because uh about kind of froze for a second to take tanning pills maybe that's why it was tanning red i don't know questionable side effects including possibly causing psychological i'll be here until 3 p.m 3 p.m my time it's one o'clock i mean not o'clock it's 105 right now uh it's 105 right now and i'll be here until 3 p.m my time so two more hours of two you got two more hours of Pixie Me talks of how she expected people talking to myself nicely to her cosplays <laughs> and was upset and wanted to cry because the cosplay community <laughs> criticized her costume. In a <laughs> journal entry from 2004, I don't know what I'm gonna to be responding do, to but criticism sure. of her Tifa costume, writing, Wait, I am cooling. sick of people telling me that I should choose costumes that look good on my body. What the f***ing My Tifa costume looks perfectly good and hot on my body. Even sick? Alright, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I am back. This, but it is my opinion. People it have is different my opinion. True, but the customer's opinion is what matters most. I will <laughs> not lengthen my Tifa skirt to make my legs look better. Especially when I think my legs are gorgeous as is. I will not forego accuracy to please some Holes who think that you have to be a stick to be a good cosplayer. That's, That's ridiculous. True. You say I'm not trying to improve my skills as a cosplayer to grow? Um, these are things I don't deem necessary to improve my skills. It's taking away from accuracy, which really pees me off, especially when there's no need to do so. Problem areas. <laughs> another matter of opinion. What one person might think is a problem, another might think of it as a blessing. For reference, this is her Tifa costume. Now, of course, the comments that this post is in reference to are now gone. But from knowing a bit about Pixie Terry, I do believe early on a lot of people just tried to give her advice on how to make her cosplays look better, and Pixie did not take that well. Pixie posted often in hopes for people to praise her. Mm, I would disagree there. Talented she was. There are people she that tell you your cosplays look like this. You're Instead a different weight from the character. She began to or different color skin. Posts. Uh, there's a lot of gatekeeping in the cosplay community, but I, I, I do know that Pixie Terry was a well cow. I think she's still active online though. She received all positive comments. The first I lower the volume of the of the video, so if if you hear me uh, comment, huh? Now it's red. 
this now it's back to green okay huh. which confused me on my journey to anyway um why so many people were obsessed with this woman if you ever Finally, hear me like uh, argue back to the video show, but to really get the full effect um, Dixie Terry began uploading videos to YouTube to an account entitled if, if you don't hear the video that I'm listening to because I I love to work on commissions while I'm listening to something and sometimes sometimes I take it take whatever they're saying to heart so uh I might argue back to the video just, just like you know, your mom would do when when she was watching to I don't know when growing up <laughs> anyway uh I did not accidentally make a your mom joke did I and every video I think I did. But anyway, um, she would eventually stop uploading so, uh, another channel. Her last I'm listening to a video about a locale in the background. Um, I'm too busy working on the commission right now to pause it so that I can talk. But, uh, they made, uh, they make some comments that I disagree with, so I might, I might, like, rebuttal or, or like get my opinion on what they're talking about butchering a japanese song by singer yutada hikaru it was also downvoted to oblivion along with pixie terry trying to get attention from her youtube channel she would begin getting into lolita pixie terry got into lolita more in 2008 and her early outfits were not terrible or unflattering in my opinion, I'm not that into Lolita fashion. And she mostly received positive comments. Pixie would receive the first wave of hate shortly after this, however. Getting noticed by the live journal, Get Off EGL, on November okay. 23, 2008. Nice. This was because Pixie Terry had posted to the EGL community live journal some of her Lolita artwork and requested that nobody criticize her. This is oh. a general no-go. Sure, it's one thing to post something one to second. your own journal and to request no criticism, which still kind of comes off as dumb. But I wonder why live journal died. Did the, the, the company do something? Did they not mark? It, their Wait, thing uh well post online, what she what happened because i'm not so about the girl with live journal hey, and the only live journal i think i ever GL utilized was artists beware and even them changed later on they switched to another wrong. website so really what really happened to live journal like why did people Although, like sorry for this Early early two thousands before Facebook was a thing, everybody had a live journal and it was social media before social media was called social media, you know. You had your little chat, you had your little group, you could make friends, you could chat with others. I think I did not have a chat window, but you could you could interact through comments. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm very curious as to like why did live journal die overnight? You know? would find because like facebook showed up and it pretty much annihilated any other social media but like for some reason like a lot of people that were very active on live journal just disappeared you know and i want to know why like my did the website have some problems did they, was there a controversy i don't know is lost to time and even more is lost during a different arc of her online presence during the stamina rose arc but we'll get to there when we get there i don't think there's any official pictorians as there are christorians you know the people who catalog christian so i'm piecing together this story as best as i can as i explored the church of pixie terry the lolita community would continue to dislike pixie the get off egl live journal posted one of the grossest things i saw during my research apparently pixie's no no photos got leaked and on September 12, 2009, the Get Off EGL Live Journal posted the nudes with the tags, Really lame and what a skank. Most comments wondered why the Lolita community would spread possible revenge. But with my limited knowledge of Lolita, it's a bitchy community. One person in the comments wrote, From what I gather from CGL, there is a large distaste for Pixie Terry in the cosplay communities, as well as Anon Lolita's talking about her too. Oh. It's really unfortunate though that someone, I assume with no reason other than to stir up, felt that the EGL community would want to see these. Again, I want to add that it's hard to pinpoint when CGL discovered Pixie Terry because I legitimately could not find any archives from CGL <laughs> before the year 2012. Uh. Anyways. Four days later, Get Off EGL would again Get mock the young lady for her Lolita outfit, posting, It still doesn't fit you. Pixie uh. Terry, that sh don't fit. Then they posted a link to one of her Lolita meetups and continued to write, And don't get me started on the others. Meetup of fail. Uh, okay. 
okay. Edit two. Bro, my bro. <laughs> Sorry for the kind of fail post. XP. I, I have been sad lately. Okay, feel bad for me. And to be fair, the Lolita community, at least around this time, was pretty negative towards anyone. I read about a total sh storm that happened because the community on CGL didn't like some girl's jacket. It's just what these girls do, I guess. I don't agree oh, with wow. it. I think it's just a dress. But hey, that's why I'm not into it. But Pixie kept on with her Japan Idol dreams. And on November 5th, 2009, she applied to a program called JET that would get her to Japan. And oh. sometime around this time, she began a job as a substitute teacher. You might still be confused as to why Pixie is considered a lolcow. I mean, she posted some cringy weed videos in 2008. She gets mad when people give her advice. And she wears some clothes that aren't super amazing. Yeah, I was confused too. This is a lolcow that has two Kiwi Farm threads, launched two gossip websites and is still discussed in many different niche gossip forums on the internet to this day. I do believe a lot of the early stuff is again lost to time. But let's continue on my journey to figure out why this woman became so popular. So 2009 ends and she still isn't that interesting. She was a lot like, like Chris Chan, but she was a, a lot more like, like a normal so. person nowadays. 2010, Pixie was rejected from the JET program and was obviously very upset. Also around this time, Pixie Carrie gets a Tumblr, which is now deleted and not archived, much like every oh. other Pixie Carrie account. I do remember laughing at her deviant art posts back in the day. She also said no one archived them. But to be honest, the cringy cosplay she would post there not the worst I've ever seen when I go to an anime convention. I'd say the year 2010 is the one where Pixie Carrie completely jumped into being a weeb. This is the year that she decided to give herself a Japanese name, Sarah Yukiko. And Miss Carrie began getting more attention around this time as she posted more and more photos of herself to gain attention and a following. So maybe someday she can become an idol in Japan. As said before, her deviant art is completely wiped from the internet, but one screenshot from 2010 still remains, dated June 28th, 2010. Why did people Pixie not the archive of her bathing suit? Underneath, a rude commenter, referred to as haters by Pixie, responded to the picture with, What's up with the extra set of boobs under your first pair? To which Pixie Carey responded, Ugh, those are boobs. Those are lines from working out. This simple back and working forth became out. a meme on many different image boards often having the bros over on fits, making jokes about Pixie's workout lines. The moment was iconic, and is one of the most memeable things Pixie Carey has done. 2010 was a different time. With more attention to Pixie, it seems people began to Photoshop her to make her appear more attractive to the various posters who made fun of her. Pixie was not happy about this, posting on okay. her live journal that she was already extremely beautiful. I'm not here to say Pixie Terry is ugly, as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but the problem that people had with Pixie was that she took the most unflattering photos and would act as if any criticism early on were people being haters. This led to more people wanting to troll the young woman. Instead of backing down, Pixie would demand that she is indeed beautiful and curvy and definitely not plus size. Pixie was extremely delusional, especially about her size. Again, I'm not doing this to insult her looks per se, but she often poorly recorded her measurements and would buy clothes about three sizes too small and then pose on camera with the zipper wide open. This whole thing would cause cosplay and Lolita enthusiasts to watch this in fascination because why would this adult woman parade herself so badly dressed online? Pixie Terry iconically responded to all criticism of her size on July 30th, 2010 with, I'm sick of people telling me what I am and what I am not, what I can and cannot do. I'm a beautiful woman. I'm curvy. I do not consider myself big nor a ham beast. I'm sure I'm going to get negative comments, but so be it. I am sexy. I am able to go to Japan. They will not call me a fat old white lady. I will succeed. And in the comments, she further wrote, I will, but it hurts. I'm sick of haters telling me I can't when I know I can. So what if I'm curvy? I'm not fat. And if Japan thinks I am, that's their problem for wanting tiny, shapeless women. What about their anime characters? What a contradiction. It's sick. But Pixie was the victim of only herself. There were multiple screenshots circulating of her insulting other women and their bodies in obvious jealousy. She responded to the criticism that she got offended by negative comments, yet said stuff about other women herself with a journal entry from September 12, 2010, writing, If any 
anyone has heard anything about me insulting girls of different body types, smaller or larger, disregard it. It is a lie. I would never do something like that. Everyone is beautiful in their own way. It's me that is insecure and wants to be the best I can and lose more weight. So that's no way an insult to anyone. Just a personal discretion about my body. And in the comments, she responded to a deleted comment by saying that she's probably in a bad mood when she wrote the nasty comment and continued. I am better without bullsh** drama for sure, but it always comes back. I just wanted to attempt to clear my name because I honestly forgot about that comment. Normally, I wouldn't say things like that. Again, a lot of these early interactions are gone now. I cannot say whether or not the backlash and the drama Pixie had been involved in was purely her fault. Surely, it doesn't help to keep posting badly posed photos and saying negative comments to other women. But nowadays, there are plenty of delusional people that would never get the amount of attention Pixie got back in the day. I mostly chalk this up as a sign of the times. Also around this time, I saw the first mention of her and Encyclopedia Dramatica. The Encyclopedia Dramatica community will be a great source of her infamy, along with CTL. So, the article written on her won't become large until the next year. 2010 closes out. And I want to note a post on December 22nd, 2010, where Pixie asks about something called gravure. I might be saying that wrong. According to Urban Dictionary, a gravure idol is a Japanese female model who primarily models in magazines, especially those marketed to men, photo books, or DVDs. Gravure idols, in most cases, emphasize their sexual attractiveness and often model in swimsuits. And looking at photos of gravure models, this definition seems fairly correct. I might be wrong, so let me know in the comments. But this is the first mention of gravure from Pixie Terry that I could find. And gravure modeling would become a focus of Pixie Terry in the later years. 2011 is when Pixie Mania really ramped up. Pixie really upped her desire to go to Japan that year and posted more and more on her DeviantArt, begging for money and being mocked by curious onlookers, most likely from Encyclopedia Dramatica and CGL. The Encyclopedia Dramatica, or ED for short, article was written around huh. the beginning of the year, summing up the woman by writing, Pixie Terry is a 30-year-old American cosplayer. She is a shapely, sexy, and cute woman, and wants you all to know about it. This article intends to document her success and the development of her career as a kawaii pop idol in Japan. The article would build on itself more and more over the course of the year as Pixie tried harder and harder to defend herself and prove she is a beautiful, curvy, sexy cosplayer. At the beginning of the year, shortly after the first mentions of the ED article, Pixie decided to take a break to let all the drama blow over. And her hiatus and avoidance of drama seemed to have somewhat worked as I did not find any more posts about her until the fifth month of 2011, where she posted to her journal multiple times, first telling her followers that she has never posted to 4chan, aka the CGL board, writing, I did not post in cams and meetups on 4chan. I've never posted on 4chan, more or less visit. I hide from that place, as I know they troll me and post me quite often, especially on CGL. So, please don't take anything on the thread seriously. Don't know what was posted? And I don't care to know. Just writing this to let everyone know that I have never posted on 4chan or visit. So, it was not me. Thanks, guys. However, if you want to message me, I'm always open to new friends. Pixie underscore Terry at Hotmail.com or MSN or Chappy Pasta You on AIM. Arigato ni? Though, someone who was allegedly her would post on CGL later on in this year. The attention Pixie Terry was getting from online trolls seemed to have affected her because over the next few months of this year, Pixie posted multiple times about being depressed, feeling fat, hiding from deviant art, and more. And on June 27, 2011, an absolute gem was posted to the CGL message board. Behind the scenes, it seemed, at least judging from posts, many women from CGL attempted to befriend Pixie to get information about her. She was a weird fascination all these girls had. And one person posted a conversation with Pixie that we'll call the famous wind chime chat log in which Pixie tells the troll that she's talking to that she believed her father was not her real father because she was convinced she was truly Japanese. She believed that her real father was Japanese because she had an Asian wind chime in her backyard. And she convinced herself that her mother had cheated on her father with a Japanese businessman and that that is why she liked anime and soy sauce so much because she was truly half Japanese. Pictures of this wind chime were also shared on other social media and people who knew the characters said it appeared to be some Chinese symbol for table or something that probably some white manufacturer made because it looked pretty.
already. Pixie Terry's delusions became very apparent here. Pixie Terry was basically transracial. In another post, date unknown, she told whoever the audience was that she knew she had to be some kind of Asian because when she is shopping for food, she is drawn to soy sauce and not the Cajun food. Yeah, that's right. Fun fact, Pixie Terry's real last name is Cajun and she would call herself Cajun rather than Cajun. And when people called her white, she demanded to be called Caucasian because it had Asian in it. Pixie, <laughs> Pixie Terry's depression continued over the year up until her birthday. Pixie legend tells of a birthday when she bought an entire cookie cake and ate it on camera on a website called Tiny Chat. Tiny Chat is an online chat website that allows users to communicate via instant messaging, voice chat, and video chat. It was really popular back in the day. The cookie cake night was a night of legend. From what I hear of it, she ate an entire cookie cake and it drank like a huge thing of iced tea by herself. People said it was like at least 4,000 calories. Well, wow. she cried apparently. Yeah. And also, I do believe over the year, Pixie she ate so much. To go on Tiny Chat for attention from her growing fan base of haters. Pixie Terry must have gotten really popular on image boards around this time. I saw memes about her on Fit that I mentioned earlier. Let me read a few. These are from August 23rd, 2011. At the gym, laughing dot JPEG everyone. Ask them what they're laughing at. Your fat stomach is so fat that it's coming out from under your size XXL shirt, LOL. That's not fat. Those are lines from working out. Them both right then and there, thanks to this gym of a line. Here's another one from the same day. See one out of ten land whale riding her rascal scooter down the street. Start following her. The thing could only go three miles per hour, LOL. Say, hey fatty fatty fat fat, why don't you slow down and save some fuel for the rest of us? She says nothing. I repeat, hey, chubsy wubsy, you hear what I said? I said, save some fuel for the rest of us, lol. She says, nothing. Hey, ambulocetus, your arms get any fatter, you're gonna have to get cut out of that moo moo, lol, lol. Stops rascal, gets up, starts walking towards me, grabs my shirt by the collar, pulls me close. I think she'll eat me, whispers in my ear. That's not fat, those are lines. She lets me go. I f her right then and there. Orgasm four times. And now, the beast, she smiles. Not only that, people on CGL were writing fanfiction about her. And next came what I believe was considered the golden age of Pixie Terry drama, I think. I know there was a golden age referenced on message boards. And judging from memes, I believe this golden age was during 2011. A lot of this year is missing, but because of what went on this year, Pixie Terry's Encyclopedia Dramatica page became the feature page of the website for two days in November. This 2012 post from a CGL archive kind of sums up how and why Pixie Terry was found and the whole culture in following her. One person asked if the only sin Pixie Terry did was self-posting on CGL, to which one user writes, she didn't post here until after CGL found her on some other website, LiveJournal or something. She did the whole come to CGL to try to defend yourself thing. I've never personally harassed her, but I have participated in these threads because I'm a terrible person and I don't know what's rustling your jimmies because you stalk Spoonie everywhere. And another anonymous person who was critical of the CGL users wrote, wow, look at how all cosplayers are small minded, clicky that do little more than pick on others they judge to be inferior. How sad. To which someone else responded, you're just learning this now? And another person writes, you must be new here. Finally, let's go into this Encyclopedia Dramatica article in detail. The intro to this article read, Introduction to Pixie Desu. Pixie Terry began as an anime-loving young child with an obsession for Japanese video games and Rumiko Takahashi. Forced to tan at a young age by her mother, she developed an aversion to looking white and desired to look Asian at all times. During high school, her mother forced her to ingest tanning pills, now found to be detrimental to health, in order to further yellow her complexion, which has caused psychological dysfunction in her brain meat. She now believed her skin to be of natural Asian coloring, leading her to question her ethnicity. Is she white or Asian? Despite holding a bachelor's degree in English and communications, her dream career is to be a singer, professional cosplayer, being an idol in Japan, or working as a model in the fashion industry. Her quest for stardom, coupled with her love of Japanese culture, means logically that she can become a kawaii 
by Japanese idol, Desu 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 Desu. These things are never going to happen. Pixie Terry also decided that her real name was too white for her liking. In order to become a kawaii idol in Japan and an internet famous Lolita, she needed a new name that betrayed her cute spirit and Asian ancestry. After casting a vote from a few options, she decided the name Sarah Yukiko and has since changed her Facebook name to align with this new identity. <laughs> However, as of late, she has been contemplating changing names again <laughs> because her friends like totally told her <laughs> Yukiko was an old-fashioned name in Japan. Uh, sorry. OMG. Didn't mean her to. potential names include Sayuki, <laughs> Sayori, Sarah Sayu, or Sarah Hiromi. She eventually settled on Sarah Misao after being told that Sarah Yukiko sounded too old school. Live Journal friends compared the name to Mary Sue. Pixie Terry is aware of this article and wants it taken down because she considers it slanderous and totally not quiet at all. So the next time someone tries to wipe this article, you know it's just one of her online boyfriends failing at the internet again. Disclaimer. None of these screen caps of her live journal slash DeviantArt are edited or altered in any way. Only the hilarious photos of her are shoot for the lols. Lately, instead of cosplaying or wearing Lolita, she's been doing hearted photo shoots, most of which are hilariously bad and can be found in the gallery section. She attended IkiCon, where a bunch of 4chaners were planning to attack, but realized it was futile, and really generally felt sorry for her. If you meet her in person, you can truly see how f***ed up she really is, and how f***ing short she is, about 5 foot 1. The rest of the article goes more into the delusions I briefly touched on, and includes some information that will come later on in the timeline. But also, there included a lot of messages from her now deleted DeviantArt. Pictures of her asking for money, but not wanting to work. As well as screenshots of her being clueless about world events. Soon, around the time this article got featured, Pixie Terry went on another one of her tiny chat streams. This is the only tiny chat stream that has footage still existing today, and it was apparently legendary. I'm going to need to give some backstory for this. Remember how Pixie Terry's convinced she's Asian, right? Well, apparently she wanted to make her hair look as dark as possible to look Asian, but her mother banned this mid-20-something-year-old lady from dyeing her hair anymore. Someone had told Pixie Terry that by not washing her hair, she could make her hair appear darker. Not only that, but people told Pixie that Japanese people do not shower and only what? take steam baths, resulting in Pixie most likely not being the cleanest. In early photos of her, she seemed fairly clean and whatnot, but oh my since goodness. the beginning up until now, with the delusion of her heritage, or heritage you, as trolls would call it, Pixie began to look... Well, grief. Oh my goodness! Suspicions of Pixie Terry stretched, and my back made those like noise when she got online for sympathy, crying. I don't know why they have to yell. And in the background, you can hear her mom screaming at her to clean herself. Oh no. Oh near. And saying that even animals clean themselves. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the stream, fans of the Church of Pixie Terry were trying to cheer her up. Church of Pixie Terry. Hey Pixie. Hey Pixie. We should probably uh get out the house for a while. Jesus Christ. Things really ramped up from here. People who knew Pixie in real life began to come to CGL to tell stories of her. One coworker wrote a Q&A on November 28, 2011. Ooh. A friend of hers also came to the forum to defend her about her ex. I think there were more people who knew her who came out to bring more drama during this time. And judging by the limited information I could find about this time, it must have been insane. There were rumors circulating about tales of sexual escapades. There were people contacting her family and sending them nudes. Someone even said someone contacted her father's work. I do believe that trolls had been speaking to her to get nudes, much like people had done to Christian on the other side of the internet, and proceeded to leak them so everyone could mock her. The drama with Pixie became so big over at CGL that they even made her a theme song. The theme song was uploaded to YouTube December 7th, 2011. 
Wake up in the morning, Picky Terry's my name. Up, I'm don't. Cosplay Pride. My mom is mad because I forgot to oh, bathe. <laughs> I see if rub some cheese in the crack of my Cause they won't know that I'm white if I look yellow from the back. I'm talking about strap sticking in my rolls. Roll. Mom begging me to change my clothes. Clothes. Block blowing up from trolls. Trolls. Watch bleach and haters are gonna hate me. When tribes tell my history, I know that I'm beautiful and sexy. Those are just my workout lines. Pixie even allegedly came to CGL to defend herself before the end of the year. It ended up being more of a Q&A with everyone from CGL really excited to get to talk to her and it was kind of nice. But shortly after that, on December 22nd, 2011, the golden age was cut short. Pixie Terry deleted everything. Her Twitter, her DeviantArt, and her photo bucket all were gone. Here is a quote from her. I have come to a few decisions regarding my life. They are not easy decisions, but it is in my best interest. One deals with DA, the other with cosplay. I'm not going to be cosplaying anymore. Fashion, school uniforms, kimonos, lolita. I will be continuing because it's too important to me. And I'll also be able to study Japanese easier with no distractions. It's hard, but I know what I must do. The golden age of- Know what I must do. What I think the golden Why does she just make it sound like it's like some anime? Like, I mean- she thinks she's Asian, so. Her public history club. I think some people dug through her Facebook and got a bunch of posts between her and a guy named James, who I believe she was kind of sort of dating at the time, and he was significantly younger than hers. Legend says he treated her like crap. Legend also says she worked as a 911 dispatcher during this time, but apparently was either let go or quit because she couldn't eat snacks at her desk. These are all legends. I don't completely trust hearsay. After months of drought from the Queen of CGL, it seemed like her photo bucket came back. Around June 16, 2012, CGL celebrated. Their queen had returned. Someone on CGL properly described what was happening on the board. They wrote, She left us, and everybody suddenly loves her. I'm not criticizing. I love her too. Now why had she left the internet? It sounded like she was tired of the drama her existence caused, simply by wanting to shine and follow her dreams. Someone on CGL posted this on September 29th, 2012. I don't even know where to begin. Remember earlier this year, when Sarah completely dropped off the map and shut down all her online accounts? It was actually because she'd been barred from posting online by her family, primarily her mother. Her mother and various other members of her family, including a sister-in-law who isn't even related by blood, had all been receiving weird emails containing messages of abuse and images of Sarah's nudes. You all remember the video that had been recorded the night Sarah was in Tiny Chat and started to cry because her mom was yelling at her to take a bath? Somebody emailed a copy of it to her mother, and a few others sent her messages of hate over Facebook, and her mother absolutely flipped the f*** out that Sarah had broadcasted it online, allowed it to be recorded, and was now being painted as an abusive parent. There was a huge fight between Sarah and her parents. At one point, Sarah apparently screamed at her father that he wasn't even her real dad hit the fan. She barred Sarah from publishing any more details about their life online or taking any more pictures of herself and uploading them to DeviantArt, which is why all her latest pictures have been photographed inside her room or outside around the city. She had actually been sneaking out with her costumes in a bag, changing into them outside and then taking pictures. Her mom removed the computer that was in Sarah's room and threatened that if she caught her taking pictures of herself or posting online that she would be thrown out the house. The vacation they took to Vegas was actually scheduled so close to San Japan so that they could try and keep Sarah from attending as they're trying to move her away from her obsession with anime and Asia and get her involved with the real world. The sister-in-law that I mentioned before, who some of you probably remember used to post here as Neon, is married to one of Sarah's older brothers. She had been asked to keep an eye on Sarah since she spent a lot of time online herself. And Sarah knows this, which is why she hates her so much. The sister-in-law was keeping an eye on her and not reporting anything back since Sarah wasn't seen to be taking any more photos of herself. But the sister-in-law does actually lurk CGL. And after she saw that Sarah was sending pictures of herself to people over Skype, she was forced to inform 
form Debbie, and now Sarah is in the shit again. Judging from archive posts, Pixie Terry's Twitter also seemed to come back, and screencaps of her being bitter began to be posted to CGL to gossip about. And people began to speculate about who she was dating and who she was talking about in various tweets as if she were a character in some drama. I'm guessing her Facebook was also opened back up to the public because soon shots of her and her outfits began to be posted to CGL for the users to laugh at. I believe, according to legend, Pixie would accept any and most friend requests from total strangers, and the ladies of CGL missed their queen and flocked to follow her anywhere they could. She no longer used LiveJournal, her DeviantArt was gone, but at this time they had Twitter, Facebook, and Photobucket to enjoy the Desu Kawaii Princess Iroru of CGL. Pixie's mom continued to be judgmental of Pixie's desire to be a cosplay queen, and online trolls continued to try to contact Pixie's mom of her new online behavior. A lot of the stuff, though, was kind of nitpicky. She just cosplayed, she had boy troubles, but CGL had become absolutely enamored with this woman. So they just posted everything they could about her online presence. Rumors started spreading around the end of October of the year that James had left her, and soon Pixie started going back on Tiny Chat, and her fans swarmed around her and tried to convince her to wear skimpier clothes on camera. They wanted to see more of their queen. People just kept making new threads on Pixie, and people would respond to these new threads on Pixie about how threads targeting Pixie would now get you banned. One event that I found funny in 2012 was that Pixie didn't win a Halloween costume contest at a gay bar, so she took her pro-LGBT bumper sticker off her car. She tends to think small things like these are slights against her personally. In November after this, Pixie's stardom reached the real world outside CGL, as one poster found a reference to her at a bookstore in the manga section underneath the Bleach mangas, which wrote, Addictive, endorsed by Pixie Terry. Pixie Terry's infamy would continue to grow outside of the internet, inside wow. the otaku world. There was another post to CGL in November about when Pixie went to the Renaissance Festival, and an excited poster talked about spotting her outside in the wild. These people were hooked. The posters over at CGL seem to have changed from disliking her to liking her. Here's a beautiful post about her from November 11th, 2012. One person writes, Yes, that's a story now. Long ago, a good child was born in the land of the rising sun to the emperor and his waifu. She was revered across the ranch for her beauty and noble heritage, but the peace that surrounded the child's birth was soon broken by a terrible monster, Gozira. He ravaged the noble kingdom of Murchi and sought to protect their kingdom's future. They sent their child to what? the land of the freedom burgers, Murdoka. Yeah. To live out her what? life until one day she may return to her native lands. As a single token of the true self, they left her a single trinket, the Hurley Win Chaimu no Haritaji. The child was cursed with filthy guys named Sara, but she has gone back to her Nipponese name, Pix Teredetsu Sama. She does have vague memories of her early rap in Nippon and knows somewhat her filthy guys and family is not her own. Pix Teredetsu Sama has already begun to shine. Yes, and so will one day become a beautiful Ajiru and make her worry. She will have to face the son of Godzilla in battle to take back Godzilla. her Godzilla. She has faced many trials to become that great warrior. She went through times of hunger when local Chinese buffet closed down for two weeks and the trial of no bath ducky time as one would expect from a noble warrior Miko Ohime-sama. One day our unworthy eyes will witness her greatness. Until that day, the great warrior will train, do crunches, and eat her native foods to cleanse her body. She looks towards the hurry when Chamu no Heritage that she's hung serenely on her back porch and waits. Someone would later post that year on why Pixie Terry can't escape her infamy on the internet, writing, Of course, who's saying Pixie Terry doesn't shoulder responsibility in all this lol countness? But making her profiles private wouldn't help. Even her close friends find their way into CGL to mock her and post things that ought to be private. It's anonymous, so they're off the hook. So privatizing anything would be pointless, and she knows it. That's why everything's public. Now, if she would actually stop uploading photos, that would be a start. But let's face it, even if she posts a normal photo of herself, no gravura cosplay or weeaboo she attributes attached, CGL would still rip that photo apart. She can't win. 
People have taken it too far already, and even if she makes an attempt to be normal, people will still rip that attempt to shreds. If I remember correctly, she got a job as a clerk or a bookkeeper, and the information was passed all over CGL. What was the point of that? She finally takes a mature leap, and people feel the need to nitpick at it? I can kind of understand why PT might think any attempt at decency would be a futile effort. CGL picks apart everything she does, whether it's normal or not. Days later, another member of the board informed posters that they tried to get Dr. Phil to have Pixie Perry on the show. Not much else happens throughout 2012. There were allegedly other Chan boards used to talk about Pixie Perry, as CGL began banning threads about her, no doubt due to the volume. But these new boards seem to be gone now. With the year 2013 coming, Pixie Terry threads were eventually altogether wiped from CGL. CGL got new rules about no longer creating threads to target individuals. The new rule involving this read, Don't bring community vendettas onto this board. Singling out individual cosplayers for the purpose of trolling them will not be tolerated. Pixie Terry continued to do what Pixie Terry does, barely paying attention to the drama communities following her. I found a post from around January 13th, 2013, where Pixie Terry posted a Craigslist looking for romance. In the ad, she talked about how she had nude photos of her online that her ex had posted and wrote that she had learned from her past mistakes. The Craigslist ad was taken down for posting pictures of her butt. Just typical Pixie Terry stuff. She's amusing but mostly harmless. The first new place to discuss Pixie Terry and her antics outside of CGL popped up on March 13th, 2013, and that place was on Kiwi Farms. Kiwi Farms is a gossip forum that focuses on eccentric individuals on the internet. This Pixie Terry thread was one of two threads of her on the site, and this first one was set up back when Kiwi Farms was the Quickie Forums. It used to be called the Quickie Forums because it was centered around talking about Chris Chan. And Quickie was short for Christian Weston Chandler. Pixie Terry seemed to be on lockdown on Twitter after this. So people began to post her tweets to Kiwi Farms and Tumblr of her talking about how she was trying to learn Japanese still, and that her mom filled out her job applications. This was, of course, truly fascinating. At this time, Kiwi Farms would post content from a now-deleted message board called Maximum where they also discussed Pixie Terry. There, it seemed Pixie had been hospitalized at the end of March. A new player came into the Pixie scene, Mitchell Verley. This small YouTuber began posting videos cosplaying as Pixie. They posted their first Pixie video on June 5th, 2013, entitled Pixie Terry Says, where they mocked various Pixieisms, such as telling fans to stop emailing her mom her nudes. Dear Twitter followers, please stop emailing my mom my nudes. That was a long time ago. I'm different. I changed. A joke about her and her cat. Where are you trying to go? <coughs> Excuse me? It's called Hello Kitty, not Bye Bye Kitty. No! Ah! Ah! A gag about her workout lines. And those were just my workout lines. Another gag on how in a lot of her photos it looks like she's pooping. 23 comments already? Oh my gosh, okay. Number one, <laughs> it looks like she's pooping. had the classic joke about the wind chimes. And that's how I know I'm Japanese, because of the wind chimes. Jenny, you're supposed to ring the wind chimes right now! You just ruined my video! They joked about how she doesn't buy clothes in her size. It only comes in extra small. Whatever, it'll fit me. I'm gonna buy it anyways. It's too small. No! I'm totally an extra small. Also, that she blocks all her haters. Oh, now they're blocked! <laughs> and that she doesn't bathe. I'm not taking a bath! You stink! I don't! I just got to even stay naturally beautiful! The grease in my hair is just for preservation! Then go sleep outside! listed some of the funny ones, and the funniest part is how the YouTube video ends. And it ends with Mitchell being tied up in the shower, as if someone had to tie up and gag Pixie Terry to force her to bathe, because she smells so bad. Pixie Terry would later say she really found these videos upsetting, which I understand to be honest. It's funny, but it's not nice. 
Meanwhile, over on Twitter, Pixie posted from her private account in May describing how disgusting women in prison are, which is kind of hypocritical for someone who was so mad at people for calling her gross years before. She even said she wouldn't apologize for saying this because no one would apologize to her. The next month, another forum to talk about Pixie Perry was created. This one was called Stamina Rose, and it seemed to be the new hotspot after CGL banned discussion. Kiwi Farms wasn't as popular to talk about Pixie at this time, as I believe it was a devoted Christian forum. Sadly, Stamina Rose has no archives of it left over. We'll talk about the grand exodus of Stamina Rose in a bit. Pixie Terry would continue to be increasingly well-known throughout the anime-loving community, and on August 19th, 2013, the same cosplayer from the Pixie Terry Says video entered their cosplay of Pixie Terry to a worst cosplay contest. The reception was great. I'm going to try and sing for you my favorite song. wasn't just some niche thing a few people knew about. She set out to be well known for cosplay, and in a way, she kind of was. At least better known than most cosplayers out there. I'll bet maybe not in the way she originally intended, but now she was being discussed on many different platforms like a real Japanese idol. But apparently Pixie did not like her newfound fame, and sometime around August 30th, 2013, she went on one of her classic tiny chat streams and began showing her fans that she was taking down her Japanese stuff. According to Encyclopedia Dramatica, this is a description of the event. In late 2013, Pixie Terry suffered one of her signature mental breakdowns and opened a tiny chat where everyone was invited to watch her cry and remove the traditional Japanese decorations from her room. She said her heritage would never be recognized. She was fat and white and would never visit Japan. These statements would have been a strange moment of clarity for Pixie if they weren't clearly just made to fish for compliments. Drama would continue with Pixie Terry and be cataloged on Stamina Rose. There was also talks of a possible Pixie Terry wiki in the making, which seems to be gone now. And the year 2013 would end, with Pixie Terry deleting her Twitter and disappearing once more. Sad artwork was created for those of her fans that missed her. I suppose Pixie eventually came back to Twitter because on the first day of 2014, Sarah decided to start a new year by telling someone their cosplay sucked and then shut down her Twitter again. Also in the January of 2014, some jerk from Kiwi Farms decided to take their following of Pixie Terry online to offline and began to try to get her fired from her job at Home Depot, where she was working at the time. The individual wrote on January 9th, 2014, so apparently some guys from Home Depot's corporate office are aware of Pixie Terry's bull but aren't going to act upon it unless she starts about work online while on the clock again. In their words, her Twitter account is closed, so we think that the issue may have resolved itself. Pixie's cosplays over the course of this year, well, kind of take a downfall. And not only was she uploading increasingly cringy cosplay, sometime around February, she began to post lewd photos of her doing age play cosplay. No, the owner of Kiwi Farms even commented on this on February 25th, 2014, writing, sent to me by an anonymous benefactor. Pixie Terry appears to be continuing her usual trend of upping the ante on how unattractive one woman can be. I believe the theme was supposed to be adult babies, so as one can imagine, eating is ill-advised while opening this spoiler, and attached with several images of Pixie Terry in what appeared to be children's undergarments. Around this time, Pixie's mom got a DNA test. The results of the DNA test were not posted, but a conversation between Pixie and an undercover hater was leaked. In the conversation, Pixie is pretty upset that she was 98% European, 1% West Asian, and 1% African. Pixie's dreams of being Japanese were being crushed. But strangely enough, later on in 2015, someone who knew her came forward and said that as of May of 2015, Pixie still believed that her real father was Japanese, and the DNA test was a lie. Soon after this, in March, it seemed Pixie had decided she also hated Bleach. The Kwai Desu cosplay otaku queen was losing her Japanese flyiness. CGL continued to nostalgia post about her. The sh Pixie Terry says person, Mitchell Verley, also came back with their final Pixie Terry video on March 13th by doing a music video to Avril Lavigne's Hello Kitty song. Mitchell Verley would leave the Pixie Terry cosplaying behind. Now they are drag queens with over 100,000 followers on Instagram and appeared on RuPaul Drag Race Canada season one. Yeah, I'm surprised too. Just a fun fact there.
I think that's them. They have the same last name, and I saw comments on their videos saying that this is where they ran off to. Back to Pixie Terry. It seems from responses on Kiwi Farms, she definitely hated Japan now. Not only did Pixie Terry find out that she was not part Japanese, but sometime around this time, I believe Pixie Terry found out that Tite Kubo, the author of Bleach, had gotten married. Kubo was her ideal husbando, and now she could not have him. She hated Bleach and anime now. Sometime also in March, or around this time, a new player in the Pixie universe came out. Someone that Stamina Rose would call Brit- We will just call him Brit, or British guy, so I don't have to keep censoring that second part. Remember him. He will become important. After the revelation of the existence of Brit, Pixie Terry deleted her Facebook around March 25th, and people would only be able to keep up with her via her photo bucket uploads. Pixie posted quite a lot of photos to this account, very awkward photos and weird poses. Legend tells it that Pixie Terry's photographer is not a person, but instead one known as Tripod Stan. Someone came to the Kiwi Farms on April 15th to give more info on Pixie Terry and her family's reactions to her online interaction, writing, Here's some info I picked up on Pixie from another forum. Don't know how legit it is or not, but it sounds reasonable. The thing is, family members have told her to stop and look at herself. Her mother even said to her a few months ago, You're not the psychic you think you are, and even bought her some plus-sized items. Of course, PT got mad. Even dumber is that she was mad that they spit. Her mom tried her best to limit PT's internet exposure and disapproves of her buying cosplay and Lolita junk behind her back when she's supposed to be paying off her hospital bills since she's a hypochondriac. The first step that her mom took years ago was making her delete her DeviantArt account. The second was to deactivate her Facebook and Twitter accounts. But we all know how well that worked out because she just came back to all the accounts minus DeviantArt, even worse than before, crazier than before. There was even a time when PT's older brothers often move in to help her mom and Papa PT, since PT herself is so f***ing crazy. Then her other brother and sister-in-law tried to get involved. Her sister-in-law basically monitors the internet to make sure that she doesn't make too much of an ass of herself. Obviously, she doesn't have much control over that, seeing as how PT kept tweeting about that James guy on and on. It was cringeworthy to watch. It felt like an ugly old woman lusting after a teenage boy. It's been what feels like ages, and she's still not over that buddy. And of course, there was the recent Huzubondo rant she had on Facebook about how she wants a man that'll basically bend over backwards for her, enable her delusional fantasies, let her spend all his money- Child, I don't care if they have like an- Hello everybody, today I want to talk about a mental illness that has led to several controversies in both hospitals and courtrooms. This illness is not only hard to identify because of its unique symptoms, but the very existence of the disease itself is often debated. And that disease, which we'll be looking at today, is Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is an extension of another mental illness known as Munchausen syndrome. Munchausen syndrome can most easily be described as faking your own illness in order to deceive others. And already we have our first hang up with identifying this syndrome. Say you were to lie about being sick so you could get out of work or potentially win a lawsuit. That's not Munchausen syndrome, that's just making a lie in order to get some certain objective. Whereas with Munchausen syndrome, the goal is the lie itself. People who are diagnosed with Munchausen syndrome will spend months or years of their life in and out of hospitals to try to convince those around them that they actually have a serious illness. When in actuality, they have either induced the sickness or symptoms on themselves, or are straight up lying about it altogether. The name actually comes from Baron von Munchausen, a fictional cavalry officer from the 1700s who there were several folk stories about him riding on cannonballs and jumping to the moon and other tall tales. In 1951, when Richard Asher discovered this syndrome, he decided to name it after the stories of Baron von Munchausen because this is essentially people telling tall tales in the modern age. The general symptoms of Munchausen syndrome and the way to spot it in the wild is that the patient will never get better, they will not respond to the regular treatment for the illness that they supposedly have, they will be very knowledgeable about their treatment, and will have a lack of visitors or people interested in their case, at least most of the time. As you can probably already tell, there is a thin line between Munchausen syndrome and just trying to get some benefit through a fabricated illness. To the degree, and we're gonna look at examples of this, Munchausen syndrome is sometimes only defined by the value of whatever the lie can give. Now that's all Munchausen syndrome, right? Someone lying about themselves in order to get some benefit or attention. 
Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which we're going to focus on today, is all of that done to another person. Or in other words, whenever someone induces or pretends that there is an illness in someone else so that they, the caretaker, can receive the attention, the fame, etc. And if it really is a mental illness, which we'll talk about the details of it today, then the very presence of it implies the harm of another individual. So today we are going to look at some of the most famous historical cases of this disease, as well as the history of the legality behind it, and ask the overall question, is it even real? I will also say the cases we'll be looking at today involve children, so if that's something that you're sensitive to, then you may want to skip out on this one. But if you are interested in that, stick around after the ad as we break down what is without a doubt the most controversial disease in modern courts and hospitals. But before we get into that, let me ask you a question. When is the last time you felt proud about your breakfast choices? That's what I thought. See, as a kid, I was obsessed with cereals that had an unholy amount of sugar in them. And now, as a pretend adult, I pretend to care about my health and always feel guilty whenever I fall back on those old breakfast foods. Well, if you're looking for something that's great for you and tastes just as good, I would like to introduce you to today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is the healthy breakfast option that contains zero grams of sugar, only four grams of carbs, and 13 to 14 grams of protein per serving. Not only that, but it's also gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and keto-friendly. And if you're like me, you're going to hear that and say, oh, okay, so it tastes awful, right? But as the guy who just cleared these four boxes and then ordered another month's worth, I can tell you for certain that it tastes pretty fantastic. To the degree that I am almost suspicious. Like whenever these four boxes came in, I tried out the peanut butter one first because I love peanut butter stuff. And I sat there for a second like, this can't be right. To which I then ripped open all four boxes and began to eat handfuls of each of them because I thought I was going crazy. Mm -hmm. And while not crazy, probably, I can confirm that the fruity flavor is definitely my favorite. Also, just as a total side note, they also put games on the backs of the boxes. And that's not a huge deal, but it means a lot to me and I appreciate it. And at only 140 calories per serving, I have no idea what kind of sorcery they put into the, well, it is called Magic Spoon, so I guess they were kind of upfront about that. And you can get in on this magical offer today by going to the link in the description at magicspoon.com forward slash windagoon and make sure that you enter discount code windagoon to get your order for $5 off. You can go to that link and get the variety pack that you see here of these four boxes or get individual boxes, sign up for a subscription service or whatever you like. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that they have a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you order it, decide you don't like it, you can get your money back, although I'm sure you'll love it. So if you're interested, check out the link below at magicspoon.com forward slash windagoon or go to Magic Spoon and use discount code windagoon to get $5 off your order. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring the video. It really does mean the most. I hope you all check them out, link in the description, and we are back to the video. We are gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. We're gonna look at a bunch of examples of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, but I wanna start out with what is considered by many to be the shining example of it. And no, not Gypsy Rose, we'll talk about her later. And that is the case of Mary Beth Tinning. Mary Beth Tinning married her husband, Joseph Tinning, in 1965. She had her first child, Barbara, in 1967, and her second child, Joseph Jr., in 1970. Everything was going well until Mary Beth delivered her third child on December the 26th of 1971. It was on that day that her daughter, Jennifer, was born with meningitis and brain abscesses. Because of these complications, Jennifer passed away one week after being born on January the 3rd. It seems like this was the switch in Mary Beth's psyche that led to her later atrocities. Two weeks after this event, she brought her second child, Joseph Jr., to the hospital, saying that he was suffering from seizures and was constantly vomiting. The hospital released him after a couple days because after putting him under surveillance, nothing was wrong and he seemed to be a healthy child. That same day on January the 20th, 
Mary Beth brought him back hours later because he had suffered a heart attack. It was too late for the doctors to do anything, and Joseph Jr. passed away. About a month later, on March the 1st, she rushed her first child, Barbara, to the same hospital. Barbara was in a comatose state, and Mary Beth said that she had been convulsing before passing out. Nothing could be done, and after a few days, Barbara passed away, with her official cause of death being listed as Ray Syndrome, which is a disease of the brain. In the span of three months, Mary Beth had lost all three of her children, but this wasn't the end of the story. On Thanksgiving Day of 1973, Mary Beth gave birth to a fourth child. Mary Beth rushed this child, Timothy, back to the hospital a few weeks after he was born, saying that he wouldn't wake up. This fourth child, Timothy, was dead, and the cause of death was ruled as SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. A little over a year later, Mary Beth had her fifth child by the name of Nathan, and was declared dead after, according to Mary Beth, they were alone in the car and he began seizing, then passed out. In August of 1978, Mary Beth adopted a baby named Michael, and two months later had a daughter, Mary Frances. Two months after Mary Frances was born, she was rushed to the hospital for, again, a seizure, before she was revived and allowed to return home. One month after that, she was brought back to the hospital again for a heart attack and died two days later. In the fall of 1979, Mary Beth had her now eighth child, Jonathan, and then a few months after he was born, he was rushed to the hospital for a heart attack and died there after spending four weeks on life support. And I know what you're thinking, how does one person have seven children die under the same circumstances and no one thinks to ask any questions? Well, you see, it is true that there are certain genetic disorders that make it very hard for someone with those genes to live past a certain age. The medical community around Mary Beth, especially considering the first death in her family took place while the baby was being born in the hospital, that the children simply had bad genes and weren't cut out to live for very long. This theory was thrown out in 1981 when the same thing happened to her adopted son, Michael. The then two-year-old child was brought into the hospital after he fell asleep and simply wouldn't wake up. This was the first time that the medical community became suspicious of Mary Beth, because up until then it was just a very tragic story of a mother who couldn't keep any of her children alive. But now that an adopted kid died due to a supposedly genetic disorder, that's when people started to look more closely at the case. So then in 1985, whenever Mary Beth gave birth to her ninth child, Everyone was watching and waiting for the worst. This child, Tammy Lynn, was born in August of that year, and sure enough, in December, was brought into the hospital after suffering a heart attack. However, this time, rather than what they had previously done whenever the child comes in, they see that the heart is stopped and they just declare it cardiac arrest, they did a full autopsy looking over every part of the child's body and eventually came to the conclusion that the child had been smothered. They then immediately exhumed six of the previous bodies in order to do full autopsies on them now that they had evidence, although at that point so much time had passed that no conclusive evidence could be found. And during the interrogation, Mary Beth signed a confession saying that she had killed Tammy Lynn, Timothy, and Nathan, although later in court she would say that she was coerced into doing this. The prosecution essentially believed that she had murdered eight of the nine children, with the first one, Jennifer, that I mentioned earlier, being the only natural death because the entire thing took place in the hospital, and as I mentioned earlier, was probably the catalyst for everything. However, she was only ever convicted for the murder of Tammy Lynn and was sentenced to 20 to life. Mary Beth serves as one of the most famous cases of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and I want to take a deeper look at that. She liked the attention of people feeling sorry for her because she had lost her children. She's an example of what we call the Munchausen by proxy syndrome, in which a parent uses or harms a child to get attention. The core theory that was mentioned in the court and with most people that talk about the case is that during the death of her first child, either she was damaged in some way or experienced such trauma that she became sort of addicted to the thrill of it all. And the reason that she's touted as an example of Munchausen by proxy is because she supposedly killed her children in order to achieve that thrill. But if that's the case, then how is it different than any other form of thrill killing? 
obviously the definition of Munchausen by proxy isn't just anyone that kills for a thrill because then that would loop in any serial killer or cult leader that did the same things because they enjoyed it. And if we narrow it down to say anyone that kills their own family for a thrill, then that would mean anyone who hated their spouse or parents and killed them because they didn't want to be around them anymore would technically be Munchausen by proxy. You could even bring it down further to say specifically children, but then that would mean that any case of filicide counts. And also, there are several other cases of Munchausen by proxy that do not involve the family specifically. It can be a caretaker looking over people in a hospital, or even through parasocial relationships online where someone on the internet convinces someone else that they're actually sick. I'm going to talk about the specific example and reasons that I feel this way in a little bit once I've shown more evidence, but I don't think that this famous case of Munchausen by proxy is actually Munchausen by proxy. See, from the 50s when this was discovered to the early 2000s, there was this huge push to call anything that involved child abuse a form of MBP, which I'm going to call it from here on because Munchausen by proxy is a long word. And because of that, there were several cases of someone just murdering their spouse or murdering their children where a, some psychiatrist would come in and say, oh yes, this is a classic case of MBP. During the court proceedings, Mary Beth said that the reason she killed her ninth child is because she was so paranoid and afraid that the child was going to die that she kind of just wanted to get it over with. Which definitely points to some mental illness in her life, but I don't think it was MVP. See, that's where the challenge comes with identifying this thing. It seems that the nature of the disease itself is in the intent. See, as it's defined and as the more infamous cases exemplify, again, except for the Mary Beth one, MBP is most often about control or the burnout that happens during the time that someone is made ill. It is about someone affecting a domain that they have control over in order to maintain or secure a massive form of control on it. The cases we're going to be looking at today are about parents doing that to their children, primarily mothers, but it can also be seen in cases such as whenever men have MVP to some degree, it is most often in a cult or religious setting in which the leader establishes themselves as the most important aspect of someone's life and then makes them ill or physically diminishes them in order to ensure that. The reason that 97% of Munchausen cases involve a mother abusing their child is because that is the most clearly identifiable way to see that behavior. For example, I've talked on this channel about the Ant Hill Kids cult and how Roche Thoreau had tortured these people and literally cut off their limbs at points in order to maintain his status as their leader and father figure. Whenever you scale that dynamic down to a household, that is most often what Munchausen by proxy is. And yes, I'm saying that cult leaders are also a form of MVP, but I guess we're just not ready for that conversation yet. That is, if we consider Munchausen by proxy to be about control, or at least control can be an aspect of it, because the other big aspect of it that most people know is the idea of attention. And while control is a massive element in that there at least has to be control in order to keep the facade going, several believe that the primary incentive for MVP is the sympathy and attention that it's given for this person with the savior complex who seems to be caring for an individual. Let's look at an example of that with Lacey Spears. In 2009, Lacey Spears gave birth to her son Garnet Spears and only nine days later brought him back to the hospital. She insisted that Garnet couldn't eat and was in constant pain. From there, a cycle began of her bringing him to the hospital, saying that he had all of these extreme illnesses that he needed minor surgeries for. And when Garnet was only eight months old, he had a feeding tube put in because according to Lacey, she couldn't get him to swallow anything. And when he did, he would just throw it back up. Not only that, but Garnet had a surgery that closes off part of the throat in order to prevent someone from throwing anything up. During this entire time, she had a blog and a Twitter account known as Garnet's Journey that talked about the details of Garnet's stories in and out of hospitals. 
Over the years, Lacey and Garnet went to dozens of hospitals, with the primary story being that he has some kind of weird food intolerance that leads to all of his symptoms. It was also believed that Garnet had cystic fibrosis, as his sweat tested positive for high concentrations of salt. Around the time Garnet was five years old, they began living at a holistic farm in New York State. Her stated reason for this being that he couldn't eat any processed foods, so if they went somewhere that was all natural, maybe he would be more okay. However, people around Lacey became suspicious because whenever Garnet was away from Lacey, he would eat a ton of food all the time, ask for seconds, and never seem sick. However, after spending any amount of time around Lacey, he went back to being an ill child. One day in January of 2014, Lacey rushed Garnet to the hospital for seizures. After spending some time in the hospital, it was determined that Garnet was completely fine and he was even jumping on the bed and running around and acting like a normal kid. That was until an event that was later seen on security cameras of the AEG in the hospital room. Garnet and Lacey went into the bathroom and whenever they came out, Garnet was incredibly ill. He began seizing, to which nurses ran into the room to try to help him, but it was no use and Garnet passed away. The police were called when this happened because it was incredibly suspicious to the hospital that the perfectly okay kid spent a few minutes alone with his mother and is now dead. Also, the police were more suspicious of her when after Lacey's father showed up to the hospital. See, Lacey's story was that the father of Garnet was her fiance, who was a cop, who was killed on the line of duty. So whenever the police are at the hospital and Lacey's dad comes in, they're like, oh, uh, we're very sorry to hear about your son-in-law passing away, you know, being a police officer and all. And the father was confused because um, she never had a fiance. And as a matter of fact, the Blake guy that she used pictures of and said was her fiance was a random cop that she went on a date with like seven years ago. And if this wasn't suspicious enough, Lacey's friend received a call from Lacey right after Garnet died, where she asked her friend to go to the apartment and throw away all of Garnet's feeding bags. Because remember, he was on a feeding tube, so whenever he was with his mother, he had to eat through one of the feeding bags. When police walked into Lacey's house, it was all of Garnet's medication on the table, and a giant canister of sea salt right in the middle. See, as I mentioned earlier, with cystic fibrosis, one of the major symptoms is a high concentration of salt in someone's sweat. And after it was discovered that the feeding bags in Lacey's apartment had insane amounts of salt in them, something like 70 packets of salt lining the inside of the feeding bags themselves, it was determined that the reason Garnet was sick for his entire life was because his mother was feeding him absurd amounts of sodium. Directly pouring salt into someone's feeding tube causes a plethora of health conditions, which would explain why anytime he was around his mother, he was incredibly ill. But it was determined that the final cause of death that killed Garnet in the hospital that day was salt intoxication. As a matter of fact, his official cause of death was swelling in the brain due to a sodium overdose. And in the hospital bed, after she was arrested and there were search warrants on her phone and everything else, they figured out that while she was in the hospital room, minutes before Garnet died, she was Googling on her phone things like salt poisoning and how much salt to kill someone and blah, blah, blah. So she had been poisoned with salt for years in order to make him appear ill and cause symptoms that were distinguishable to some doctors as being part of cystic fibrosis. So if she's telling the truth on that, she's probably telling the truth about other stuff wrong with him. And then there in the hospital, she overdosed him, which ended up killing him. Here's the thing, I don't think, and I don't mean this in a morality way, not like this exonerates her at all. I don't think she meant to kill him that day from like a purely objective basis. Like, essentially, her son was her toy. She used him in order to get clout online and to appear interesting and garner sympathy from strangers and all of that. And I think the reason she was Googling that on her phone is because she was like, oh man, if we leave the hospital now and he doesn't look sick, that's going to look really bad on me. So I'm going to get him super sick, like to the point of death, and then they'll all believe me, which is almost arguably worse. 
to which she was convicted for the murder of her son, and the judge during the court proceedings even said that she had Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Instead of nurturing and protecting a beautiful child, you subjected him to five years of torment and pain. One does not have to be a psychologist to realize you suffer from a mental illness known as Munchausen by proxy. Now looking at all the details of the Spears case, that is identifiable and easily seen as definitive MVP, like down to the control aspect, down to the attention aspect, all of it. Now juxtapose that to a different case that is also often considered MVP, like the case of Blanca Montano. In 2011, she was convicted to 13 years of prison for the poisoning of her young daughter. Essentially, she had been poisoning her daughter for years with E. coli bacteria in order to make her sick, and at one point even wanted a marrow biopsy done to try to determine what her illness was, and was caught whenever she was seen, again, on hospital security cameras, contaminating her daughter's food with E. coli samples. It was determined in the court trial that followed that she was doing this in order to garner attention from the child's father. Essentially, they had hooked up and she became pregnant with the child and then he didn't want anything to do with her. So she thought, oh, if my daughter gets sick, maybe he'll come back. While absolutely tragic and evil, this is often considered a case of Munchausen by proxy. And I don't think it should be. Similar to the example I gave earlier, about lying about having an illness or whatever in order to achieve an end goal. This is just that with more heinous and longer steps. And I think whenever you take something that is considered by some to be a legitimate mental illness and considered by others to be an excuse, so to speak, in legal systems, and when you just kind of like flippantly apply it to everything, like, oh, this woman murdered her kid, that's MVP. Or, oh, look, this girl almost killed her kid in order to get the kid's father back, that's MVP. It kind of becomes a meaningless term. See, if we look at it by just the specifics or symptoms, so to speak, that you can identify MVP through, then Blanca Montano had all of the symptoms. She had a ton of knowledge about the condition that her daughter had. She had the multiple hospital visits. She got into fights with doctors about it, etc. But the motive wasn't there. Someone who, again, I keep using the lawsuit example, but it's the easiest. Someone who's trying to win a lawsuit against, I don't know, McDonald's because they like got poisoned of a Big Mac. I don't know why my brain went to that. May do the same thing in a hospital in order to win a lawsuit, but it doesn't mean they have Munchausen syndrome. To effectively narrow it down, and this is more so the consensus in modern psychology circles, it needs to be stated as the motive behind the thing that is happening. And because of that, you may be asking yourself, or just in general, if you think this video is dumb, you may be asking yourself, well, why does this matter? Why does it matter what MVP is, or if it's misidentified, or given the wrong attributes, or whatever? Like, if it's just a means to an end, then why should anyone care? If someone poisons their child and we're all like, oh, but then they're like, ah, but they poison their child by proxy. Do we all go, uh? Oh. And while it may not matter on an individual basis, like if someone's poisoning their child, then they're poisoning their child. I don't care if they have like an affinity for it, get the child away from them. But where it absolutely matters is in legal cases. Because depending on how we define it and how we attribute it as a mental illness, it could imply that it is a mental illness that the very presence of suggests that the individual is guilty. Think about it. Imagine if you have someone who is standing trial because they supposedly abuse their child. And if the evidence is kind of in the middle and the jury's essentially hung on what the verdict is, but then you have a doctor come in and say, oh, well, they give the symptoms of having Munchausen by proxy. Well, then that would mean that the very existence of the mental illness means they're definitely guilty. And as I mentioned earlier, the very concept of this mental illness is a little shady in itself because if it is something that person is preconceived to, then that would theoretically mean that they would have a more lax treatment in a court of law. It's primarily the latter point as well as the fact that MBP 
is a rather recent discovery and has like you know circumstantial evidence at best for it existing that the american psychology association has never officially named it as a mental illness at least they've never named it by name but i'll talk about that in a bit that previous point that i mentioned that its presence implies guilt even if guilt is undecided led to a ton of controversy in the 90s and 2000s primarily due to a doctor by the name of Roy Meadow. Roy Meadow was the doctor who kind of championed the idea of MBP and made it what it is today in modern courts and medical circles. However, that had some major consequences, such as that of the case of Sally Clark. In 1999, Sally Clark was convicted for murdering her two children. During the trial, the evidence was kind of circumstantial. Both of them had been found dead in the home, supposedly they just quit breathing. And similar to the Mary Beth story that I talked about earlier, she rushed them to the hospital and both of them were dead. However, in the midst of this trial, Roy Meadow comes forward as an expert witness and begins talking about how Sally Clark has all the symptoms of Munchausen syndrome by proxy and how that means she was definitely likely or in favor to murder her children. The jury, thinking that this testimony was evidence of a motive, convicted her for the murder of her two children. Three years later, lab tests were done and it was determined that the children died due to a rare illness. And then even more tragically, due to all of the shame she received during this, four years later, Sally Clark died due to alcohol poisoning. Because of this, Roy Meadow was hyper-analyzed by the courts, saying that maybe him showing up and accusing women of having this syndrome, that he's really in favor of making a popular deal, isn't the best idea. And during the investigation of Roy Meadows, two other women who were put away due to his testimony of MVP were let go after further results showed that they were innocent. He had his license taken away from a year, and then it went back, but then he wasn't really asked to show up at any trials anymore. But that in itself shows the harm that MVP can cause just by existing. Because if you have a case where it's undecided if the person is guilty or not, and then you're like, hey, do you know that they have a rare mental illness that means they will definitely always hurt their child for attention? How is that not going to throw a jury's opinion? It was because of this Roy Meadows drama that in UK and Australian courts, Munchausen by proxy is legally not a medico-legal entity. Medico-legal, that's a great word. In other words, within the courts of the UK and Australia, Munchausen by proxy legally does not exist. It can be used as a description of one's behavior, but not as a diagnosis or entity itself. The reason for this being, MBP is essentially all the motive someone would need. The example that the court uses like this, if you have a doctor who goes forward, say there is a mother who murdered her child, and the doctor is talking about how, oh yes, well, the child was asphyxiated, and this is the symptoms that prove it, and this is the logical evidence that shows what happened to the child, and blah, blah, blah. That is all in the realm of physical facts and biological details, etc. But then, if you consider MBP to be a mental illness, and then you have the same doctor go, yes, and the mother absolutely has MBP, that is the motive being shown through a kind of hazy, technically factual mental illness, meaning that a motive can be derived from logistics, and that's why British courts kicked it out. In other words, it can ruin a trial because someone with MBP will always harm a child. And also through this entire video, I've used the example of a parent and a child because that's by far the most common example. But like I mentioned, it can also be done with things like religious groups or nursing providers or elder abuse, etc. But because of everything that I just mentioned, if Munchausen by proxy is real, then it is an illness without innocence. Because if you have it, then you've absolutely done the thing that you're being accused of. And again, this is the reasons that most of the courts kicked it out. And it's the reason the United States is not even considered a mental illness. However, Munchausen syndrome, the one where you think that you yourself have the disorder, is absolutely considered real. And there are far more cases of someone pretending to be sick in order to garner attention and sympathy and what have you than there are of people doing it to someone else. 
As a matter of fact, the two are sometimes seen together, as is the case with our next example we're going to look at, Hope Yabara. Now, Hope had a history for lying in the first place. She was a chemist with a doctorate, and in 1998, she told her husband that she was getting a, quote, one-year PhD degree. To which, on every Tuesday and Thursday for one year, she would leave the house and, I guess, drive around and do whatever, and then come back and say that she went to class. After supposedly getting this PhD, she began to call herself PhD Hope Yabara, as well as put the title on business cards. When again, she never actually got a PhD. After her first daughter was born, she claimed that the daughter had cerebral palsy. Not only that, but for the first year of her daughter's life, she said that she had an autoimmune disease and made her wear ankle braces. However, a year later when her second daughter was born prematurely, that took all of Hope's attention. So much so that she simply took the braces off the first child and said that she got over it. In 2001, Hope said that she had been diagnosed with bone cancer and for the next eight years began to perform acts that showed symptoms of the illness. She would leave the house and shave her head and eyebrows and tell people she was going through chemotherapy. She would make up stories about how it was spreading to other parts of her body, but was leaving in some areas and constantly kept her health in a sort of teeter-totter. She moved to Alabama for eight months, saying that the region had a special treatment that was only available there. She even learned sign language and had a cochlear implant installed because she said that the cancer was affecting parts of her brain and was eventually going to cause her to lose her hearing. She even had this entire story that she was pregnant, she told everyone else around her that she was pregnant, and for five months wore maternity clothes, said they were twins, and even had names picked out for them, before one day saying that the chemotherapy caused her to miscarry, to which with no one else around, she had a quick funeral for them, place them in urns and then put the urns on the fireplace the urns were sealed by the way and after everything i'm about to talk about happened they broke open the urns and they were just empty remember the second child that i mentioned the one that was born prematurely well at a young age hope had a feeding tube installed in her second child getting a g-tube a gastrostomy tube to feed the child is the most common procedure in medical child abuse and that's because um it's probably one of the easiest um, disorders to fake to a physician. So you present with a feeding issue with your child. Well, we're not watching the child eat in our clinic. And just as with the Spears case, began to feed her daughter salt and then doctors believed the child had cystic fibrosis. She even had an intravenous central line put in on that daughter, which is essentially an IV that goes up to or into the heart, and it's believed that she began removing bits of her daughter's blood in order to make her appear anemic. During one procedure called an iron dextrin infusion, which is something they do with dangerously anemic people to try to put iron back into their system, the daughter nearly died because again, they're trying to flood iron into a system that for one doesn't need it and is also lacking on blood. And if it wasn't for the doctors quit working, she would have died of metal poisoning right there. See, Hope was also a chemist and because of her fake PhD, which I have no idea how no one certified at any point during this, she had a position at a pharmaceutical company working with pathogens. The way she was found out is because people at work got suspicious that she was ordering pathogens that weren't being used in the lab. She was eventually caught for this after it had gone on for 10 years and she was arrested for child abuse and misusing justice and lying to hospitals and a whole bunch of other minor charges. She still keeps up the compulsive lying thing to the degree that in one of the interviews I watched with her, Whenever she walked up to the interviewer, she had a piece of paper that said she was deaf or hard of hearing. And like in the beginning of the interview was doing sign language and had like a speech impediment. But as the interview went on, she just quit doing that. Factitious disorder, or Munchausen, is when someone exaggerates, feigns, 
or some people would call it malingering an illness or creating an illness that doesn't exist. So at the very least, Hope was a compulsive liar. Which begs the question, is Munchausen syndrome by proxy just some form of elaborate compulsive lying? And I won't spend as much time disproving it as I did the thrill kill argument, but in short, no. See, there are people who are compulsive liars who don't do things like destroy the livelihoods of family members and then poison their children for a decade. So while that is definitely an aspect in MBP because it requires some level of dishonesty, there's something more to it than that. There is something else to the level of depravity that these people will reach to. And also, in case I haven't made it clear enough because I'm kind of just playing devil's advocate on every side of the aisle at once, I am not trying to state in this video that it definitively is a mental disorder or isn't or whatever. I'm just more so trying to show the points of it and while there are proponents on both ends. And the most definitive point that I'm trying to get to you in this video is that it is an interesting point of contention within medicine and legal systems that I think deserves to be looked into. And also, in case it's not clear enough, I am a YouTuber who makes videos about stuff that I think is cool and neat and not a doctor or a psychologist at all. So to just clear everything up here, do not take the things I say in this video and then use them as a justification to label people or talk about like what someone may or may not have because that would be not good. Again, just taking something that I think is interesting and worth talking about and showing that to you guys. So while I'm on the high horse of being a guy with a camera and YouTube channel who thinks I can classify mental disorders, let's talk about Jack Barron. Jack Barron murdered his wife and then at the funeral seemed to be garnering and loving the attention from everyone as well as cashing her life insurance policy before doing the same thing with his two other children. He seemed to be so comfortable with the deaths of those in his immediate family that at the second child's funeral he wore a t-shirt and just drank beer and like casually talked to his friends. And it is a point of debate if he was doing it because he liked the attention or if he hated his family or if he liked the life insurance policy. And again, while this is a combination of attention, control, and wealth and is garnered through doing bad things to members of your family, I don't think this is Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Again, everyone touts it as such. If you search guys with MBP, he's one of the first stories that'll pop up. However, again, if we take what is potentially a very diverse or specific disorder that can be attributed to some people, and just say anyone that murders someone to get a life insurance policy counts as it, then it's a meaningless term. And again, my purpose with all of this isn't to say, yes, it is a mental disorder, because that would imply some level of alleviation or predisposition to the things they're doing. And in every one of these cases, I feel that the individual in question was absolutely capable of moral decisions, or at least if they weren't, it's not related to the MBP. But where I feel it is more important is with the condemnation of those same behaviors. In other words, maybe if we don't look at it as a mental illness and we look at it in the way that British courts describe it as, as a description of behavior, then perhaps it should be used to condemn those who match the description. And if we're using that definition that it is not necessarily a mental illness, but instead just a pattern of behavior, then I believe that one of the best examples of why someone with MBP should be condemned and actions against them could be justified is that of the most infamous Munchausen by proxy case probably ever now, which is the case of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Dee Dee Blanchard gave birth to Gypsy Rose Blanchard in 1991. At only three months old, Dee Dee took Gypsy to the emergency room saying that she was suffering from sleep apnea, although there was no evidence of this. At a young age, Dee Dee began to tell people that Gypsy had chromosomal disorders, muscular dystrophy, and a series of other conditions that caused her to be very sickly and require a walker. At eight years old, Gypsy was on the back of a motorcycle being driven by her grandfather to which the bike gently tilted over and Gypsy scraped her knee. From this, Dee Dee said that Gypsy's legs were destroyed and that she now had to sit in a wheelchair. 
And from there, Dee Dee began showing off Gypsy everywhere. They went to Special Olympic events, they went to pageants for disabled children, and sometime between kindergarten and the second grade, Dee Dee pulled Gypsy from school in order to homeschool her. Every single minor thing that was potentially not even wrong with Gypsy caused Dee Dee to immediately rush her to the emergency room. To the degree that if Gypsy coughed, that, that's a trip to the ER right away. Dee Dee also began saying that Gypsy was suffering from eye and ear problems, which she also didn't have. And Dee Dee was able to put Gypsy on various medications for things such as seizures. Dee Dee and Gypsy were victims of Hurricane Katrina, and because of it, they lost their homes as well as all information about their previous lives. Because of this, Dee Dee was able to change their names and fabricate an entire medical history. As a matter of fact, her name wasn't even Dee Dee Blanchard. That's a fake alias she gave herself in order to get in and out of hospitals. Her real name was Claudine Pitchery. And from there, they became a massive news story. See, to everyone else who was watching, Gypsy was a child with various medical problems who lost her home in Hurricane Katrina. And because of this, they had a house built by Habitat for Humanity, they had several stays in the Ronald McDonald house, they went to several Miranda Lambert concerts and got to meet Miranda Lambert because of Make-A-Wish, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation also sent them to Disney several times. During this entire time, Gypsy's father kept wanting to come meet Gypsy, and Dee Dee just told him not to come around and stay away, normally by lying and having to reschedule and other complications. But at the same time, Dee Dee was telling everyone else that Gypsy's father was an abusive alcoholic who they were in hiding from. Whenever Dee Dee was eventually confronted by the police about changing her alias, her story was that they were hiding from Gypsy's abusive father, so they changed their name in order to protect themselves. She would also do things like shave Gypsy's head, as well as even lie to her about her own age. Like on Gypsy's 18th birthday, her father called to wish her a happy birthday, and Dee Dee said, don't tell her that she's 18, she thinks she's 14. And everywhere they went in public, Dee Dee would attach a feeding tube and oxygen tank to Gypsy's wheelchair. Keep in mind, through all of this, she didn't need any of it and was perfectly capable of walking, and Dee Dee simply managed to make Gypsy play along through physical and verbal abuse. Gypsy would later say that anytime they were in public and she would say something that implied she wasn't that sick, her mom would squeeze her hand or kick her under the table, and then whenever they got home would physically beat her with a coat hanger or yell at her saying that she was being a terrible daughter. There were various minor surgeries too that Gypsy didn't need she was given, such as a bar placed in her mouth because the seizure medication she was taking caused her to lose her teeth. Her salivary glands were removed because her mother said that she was over salivating, which according to Gypsy later, every time they'd go to the doctor, uh, Dee Dee would rub like this tar in her mouth that would make her salivate more, so her salivary glands were removed. She even had tubes implanted into her ears for drainage, which again, she didn't have. The first and only real backlash Dee Dee got during any of this was one neurologist who examined Gypsy and then told the mother, this child is perfectly capable of walking and the mother got offended and walked out, as well as an anonymous call that was made in 2009 to the police department saying that Dee Dee was not her real name and also she is just making the child pretend to be sick and she's not actually sick. To this day, no one knows who that call was, but whenever the police went to Dee Dee and confronted her, the police said that, yeah, this looks like a sick kid, and then Dee Dee gave the whole story that they were running from an abusive husband and the police just didn't look into it anymore. Things began to culminate as Gypsy got older. As a matter of fact, one of the only things that Gypsy had any say in was her internet activity. One year she went to a convention and hooked up with a boy that she had met online. Dee Dee found out about this and threatened to report the boy to the police if he ever said anything to Gypsy again, because according to Dee Dee, Gypsy was a minor at the time, even though she really wasn't. After they got home from this event, Gypsy said that her mother smashed the computer with a hammer and then for several weeks, handcuffed Gypsy to her bed. After this, Gypsy began to plot how to get away from her mother, and every night after her mother went to sleep, would talk to people on the internet. It was during this time she met a man by the name of Nicholas, and they began, I can't believe I'm using this word, e-dating. And after one meetup where they actually met each other in person, in June of 2015, 
they decided that Nicholas would murder Gypsy's mother. To which one night, Nicholas broke into the house, stabbed Dee Dee to death, and Nicholas and Gypsy then escaped. During this escape was also the first time that Gypsy had been in public without her wheelchair since she was eight years old. Eventually, the two of them were caught, Nicholas getting the brunt of the punishment as he was the one who actually carried out the murder, with Gypsy being sentenced to 10 years in jail. While speaking about her mother in an interview she did with BuzzFeed in 2018, Gypsy said she would have been the perfect mom for someone who was actually sick. So again, speaking overall about MVP, if it does exist, then Dee Dee Blanchard is the textbook case. She managed to control every aspect of Gypsy's life, she benefited from it financially, and she garnered all the attention she wanted during this time. Not only that, but she didn't kill her daughter and seemed to continuously use her as a tool to achieve her desires. So if this is the true, undeniable case of MVP, then let's ask ourselves, if MVP serves as a mental illness, does that exonerate Dee Dee from what she did to her daughter? No. There are absolutely cases with mental illnesses where someone does wrong things because they're either incapable of stopping themselves or controlling themselves from those urges, or they're just incapable of justifying or determining what is right or wrong. However, even if you view Munchausen by proxy as being a mental illness, Dee Dee was capable of knowing that what she was doing was wrong. Hence the series of hoops she jumped through in order to lie about family members and lie to the police and lie to doctors, etc. She was not incapable of discernment. As a matter of fact, she was really good at discernment because she knew exactly what traits to hide and what traits to exhibit, like care and love for her daughter. So if we go off of this as the ideal case of MVP, then we can agree with the courts and say that it is not a justification for behavior, but perhaps a motive for one. So if Dee Dee essentially knew better, and it wasn't something that overcame her, and she followed her own selfish desires in spite of knowing what was wrong, then in that case, MVP absolutely serves as a way to condemn certain actions. If it's a way to describe a particular pattern of behavior in a person, then it can certainly be decided as a motive for legal actions. As a matter of fact, in American judicial systems, this is kind of the take that's currently being used. The name it's given in American legal systems is fabricated or induced illness by caregivers. That's not as cool as Munchausen syndrome by proxy, but it's the same idea. Because it's not used to describe a syndrome or a mental illness, instead it's describing a behavior, an induced illness by a caregiver. I've seen a number of these. They don't give the child the proper medicine and they keep going to the doctor and, and, and telling the doctor, you're not trying hard enough, you don't understand my child, here are all the symptoms they're having, and the doctor's puzzled, and of course, most doctors and most professionals and most people don't even consider the fact that they're feigning this illness. So if we look at that, fabricated illness by caregiver, which is abbreviated to FIC, and since MBP and FIC are the same thing, at least in a legal aspect, or as we decided from this point of conversation that it is not a mental illness, and since D.D. Blanchard exhibited FIC, the big question is, does that justify the actions of Gypsy? Yes. <laughs> In a perfect world, people who were bad would be punished for being bad, and people who were good would be punished for being good. However, the world isn't perfect, so there is a series of legal ramifications and set rules in place that are put up by establishments of man, yada yada. And because of the very nature of that, of the idea that we are taking a humanity that is different compositions of gray and making them get in single file lines of black and white legality, there's always going to be overflow in one camp or the other. So that being said, Gypsy Rose did nothing wrong. <laughs> like legitimately, this is no different than uh, someone who's in an abusive relationship for years and constantly being beat and tormented. And Gypsy had been putting up with years of physical and mental abuse and surgery she didn't need and forced to sit in a wheelchair and again i know she did the murder and it wasn't technically in immediate defense of her life but it was absolutely in defense of her life like if you were in your house 
and someone comes up to you and they point a gun at you and you shoot them first that's obviously self-defense right but if you were in your house and you were like getting water from your refrigerator and there's a guy on top of the fridge and he's pouring like poison into the water filter of the fridge like are you just supposed to be like oh man i guess i'm dead now like i don't care if it's not a physical immediate attack and yeah i know the logical solution is gypsy should have just stood up and went and told someone but that's kind of ignoring all of the aspects of you know stockholm syndrome and physical and verbal abuse itself Gypsy was absolutely in fear of her life, and I think it's ridiculous that the legal solution for everything is that she would just sit there until she died. Also, to give you an idea of how hated Dee Dee was, whenever Dee Dee died, she was cremated, and her ashes were sent to her father and stepmother, and they flushed them down the toilet. Her own father flushed her ashes down the toilet. That's how despicable of a person this was. So, you know, not only did Gypsy save herself, but she also did a net positive by, you know, speeding up the whole life thing for someone who was clearly not appreciative of theirs. So while in the poster child case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, I do not think that it justifies the actions of Dee Dee, the one committing the case, but I feel it absolutely justifies the actions of the proxy itself, that being Gypsy. If we view it as a mental illness, or at least not a mental illness to the degree that it disables someone's ability to determine right or wrong, then in specific cases like this, where it's essentially a very slow murder carried out over the course of years or even decades, then I think it's perfectly reasonable for the proxy to decide that it wants to stop being a proxy. But at the end of the day, I am a guy who is telling you about this on the internet because I think it's interesting, and the truth of the matter is, I don't know. And a lot of people who are experts in this field don't know as well. It is still being debated in medical circles if Munchausen syndrome by proxy can be viewed in the way Munchausen syndrome is, in that it is an explanation for certain behaviors and possibly a justification for some. And while most have put away that idea, it is still debated if it should even be allowed to occur in any legal space as the very existence of it implies guilt. And on top of that, should it throw a case? Because if it is something that can cause an individual to carry out these heinous acts, well then maybe it's good to have a motive to tie in that can prove if they're guilty or not. These are all big questions, stuff that is still being debated and not a lot of people really talk about. And while it's always interesting, at least to me, to look at cases of this and try to understand human psychology and where everyone's coming from and the arguments around it, I think there is another point of interest here apart from most of my videos because we're kind of in the conceptual stages for what could be eventual decisions when it comes to cases of child abuse or elder abuse or what have you. 10 years ago, Munchausen syndrome by proxy was a definitive surefire thing that if someone had it, lock them up straight away. And now it's kind of in the back and forth of if it's even a mental illness or not. And 10 years from now, it could be something completely different. I wanted to bring all of this to you today because it is active developments in the realm of legality and medicine. And I think that that's pretty interesting. Not the you know, abuse and child murder part of it, the socio-political implications of it. And hey, hopefully you got something out of all of this, as I certainly did researching it and telling you about it, and I had a great time, and hopefully you had at least an okay one, and thank you for watching. I also want to say off the bat, there is a fantastic video by the internet investigator called Munchausen by Internet, which is about someone who convinces other people online as in is convinced online that she herself has several physical disabilities. Um, and I really wanted to find a way to mention that video in here, but the only time I really mentioned Munchausen syndrome was in relation to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So it didn't really fit, there wasn't a place to bring it up. But right here I wanna say it's a great video. I'll link it below, it's really cool. She does a great job with a lot of her stuff. Um, so yeah, I just think that it's a good video. So you should check it out if you're interested in this one because Munchausen syndrome, like I said, is a much more clearly defined thing. People fake their own illnesses in order to receive attention or 
what have you, sometimes just for the essence of being near hospitals or in caregiving positions. Um, but it's whenever it's done to someone else because now there's an act of violence involved. Um, instead of just someone harming themselves in order to get attention or whatever, it is someone hurting someone else for attention. And that throws all the cards off the table because now we're talking about acts of violence and potentially murder in some cases and blah, blah, blah. And I've talked about this long enough. I'll shut up now. Uh, but thank you for watching. If you've stuck around this long to my insane rant, um, this one was actually interesting. I, w I started this out just like, oh, I'll just talk about a bunch of cases of Munchausen by proxy because I think it's interesting. And then I come across all these court records and stuff about how like right now it's contested if it's even a thing or not. And the video kind of morphed into, well, how about I talk about the nature of it itself and I'll use these cases I was researching as evidence or as uh, not evidence, essentially uh, examples from either side of the aisle about you know munchausen syndrome by proxy itself and i'm a little nervous right now i'll admit uh before editing this or anything because i did a lot of rambling and i went a lot of different directions there was i've been recording for two and a half hours now no i did what this will cut down to because for one there were several rambles that i'm probably gonna have to cut and there was also several just periods of silence where i would be mid-sentence and be like where do i want to turn this point to so in other words right now i have no idea how this is going to turn out it could be the worst video i've ever made um i'm a little worried <laughs> um but <laughs> i guess you guys know more than i do right now so let me know how it went i guess um man that's bizarre me right now doesn't know you in the future even though for you it's the present how anyway enough of that esoteric stuff um my brain is fried <laughs> thank you all for watching um if you stuck around this long thank you so much to all of my patrons i guess you're still the patrons to me even though you're technically former patrons because the patreon's gone now um but your names are here so thank you my patrons my top tier patrons for establishing all of this and allowing this to continue to the degree it has and it really does mean a lot so thank you for that Thank you so much to my subscriber. I think is my subscriber, my one subscriber, my subscribers. I think we just hit 1.1 million. So since the 1 million, since, you know, that plaque got sent and all that stuff, it's now been another uh, 100,000 people, which I'm still amazed that two people watch this channel uh, and my mom's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> much less 1.1 million like my word um no wow. way and i just did that whole random rant about the legitimacy i just came back to the chat no not rocky rocky oh he was such a good boy little old me Aww. He was such a good boy. I'm gonna miss him. He was such a sweet boy. No. I mean it's it's understandable he was he was old he was more than 10 but I'm sorry I'm going to miss that boy
Cookie, Cookie is... <laughs> cookie is getting old. How is Cookie? She is getting old. She she is not too old yet, but she is getting old and grumpier. You know? <laughs> She still has a lot of energy though. It's it's incredible how even though she is a little bit older than before, she she still has a lot of energy. The lover of energy, peace. <laughs> At first, when we first moved, when I first moved here, she did not like the other dog, and she was very grumpy. She was like, I don't like this dog, I don't like anyone here. But now she's she's more accustomed and like always she is the one in charge and she doesn't care what other people think. She's always the one in charge. Cookie's living with me. She is living with me. She does not like my, my other dog, like I said, but she is. Cookie's living with me. Uh, Rosie, Rosie. Oh yeah, you. I remember. Um. Right before I moved to the United States, um, I remember she started working on her visa or something like that. That's good to know. Fijaos que sucede, busca la llave en todas estas torres de PC. Las abre todas. <laughs> oh, wow. It was nice. It, it's nice to know that she's escaped. <laughs> let me see, let me see if I got everything. Bueno, right. Bienvenidos al canal. ¿Sabéis por qué los PCs de finales de los 80 y principios de los 90 llevaban todos cerraduras por todos los lados? Estoy seguro que muchos de vosotros no lo sabéis. De hecho, había periféricos que se ponían al lado que también llevaban una especie de candado o cerradura. Pues bueno, el vídeo de hoy vamos a desentrañar el misterio del por qué esto era así. Seguramente los mayores de 40 años, entre los cuales me incluyo, ya lo sabéis de sobras, pero los menores de 40 no lo sabéis. Así que yo creo que nos vamos a detener a paso. Venga, vamos para allá. Este vídeo está patrocinado por nuestros amigos de GBGMall, una página web en la que podremos comprar números de serie de programas y sistemas operativos. En ella podremos comprar case de Office o, por ejemplo, de Windows 10 Professional. Como veis, comprar esta licencia es bastante fácil y además económico. Ya que estamos, me voy a comprar una clave para uno de mis PCs viejunos. Y diréis, ¿dónde está el truco? Un Windows 10 por tan poco dinero. Esto es porque las licencias de Windows que venden son versiones OEM. Son totalmente legales, pero tienen sus limitaciones. La más importante es que van ligadas a la placa base de tu PC. Por lo que si no vais a cambiar el hardware del PC mucho tiempo, pues os puede salir muy a cuenta. Os dejaré links en la descripción del vídeo de su web. Y si compráis una licencia con el código de descuento TV20, tendréis un 25% de descuento. Un 5% más que de costumbre. Corred, insensatos. A finales de los 80, principios de los 90, a nivel de seguridad, la informática era pues, un auténtico desastre. Pensad que no había prácticamente interconexión entre los ordenadores de por internet, internet no estaba en todos los países, a nivel de seguridad era un coladero realmente. Eh, el tema es que claro, había gente que tenía miedo de sus datos, de su confidencialidad, de, imagínate que tienes tu hoja de cálculo de tu empresa, que la tienes en tu PC, en tu 386, con el Lotus 123, y tienes miedo pues que, que venga alguien y te la robe. 
¿vale? En aquellos momentos, pues bueno, no todo el mundo podía disponer de una infraestructura de red para tener sistemas operativos de red que tenían una seguridad centralizada, como por ejemplo Nobel, eh, Windows NT, las primeras versiones que ya tenían pues, un sec. poquito de seguridad. <risa> Eh, pero ¿qué pasó? Que bueno, había mucha gente que no se podía permitir eso, ni siquiera tener una red en su, en su empresa o en su casa. Así que nada, comenzaron a surgir una serie de cosas para intentar securizar lo que eran pues, sus datos. Comenzamos, por ejemplo, con esto que veis aquí, un archivador de disquets. Era un cacharrito que ponías al lado del ordenador y bueno, ahí almacenabas tus disquets y la mayoría de estos dispositivos llevaban una cerradura la cual la cerrabas y bueno, tus datos estaban ahí y, y quedaban salvaguardados. Nadie que no tuviera tu llave pues podía acceder a, a sacar los disquets. ¿La realidad? Pues la realidad es que si haces un poco de fuerza puedes romperlo y puedes abrir. O sea que no, no era muy seguro. En otro orden de cosas había otros dispositivos más interesantes que eran estos que tenemos aquí, fijaos. Es un rack eh, para hacer extraer el disco duro. En este caso tengo uno con caja original y todo. Y bueno, estos dispositivos se ponían en las torres de los PCs, en lo que era el hueco de una disquetera de 5 y cuarto, pues era el tamaño que tenían. Lo ponías, lo conectabas al bus y a la alimentación. Y entonces de esta manera, pues tenía una especie de cajoncito que tú ponías tu disco duro. De tal manera que, bueno, lo insertabas, le dabas a la llave, a la cerradura, y entonces ya podías eh, utilizarlo sin ningún tipo de problema. ¿Qué pasaba por la noche? Bueno, pues sacabas tu jornada laboral o tu sesión en tu casa de hacer tus cosas y tal, apagas el ordenador, sacabas la llave y te llevas el disco duro. Esto, bueno, era una manera de llevarte tus datos a cualquier lado, ¿vale? Sin ningún tipo de, de problema para que no te los robaran y esas cosas. Pero claro, el problema es que si se te caía o lo que sea, claro, el disco Oh, I haven't seen that uh, que, bueno, from, no from Illuminatus. Así que no I might actually todo, end the stream bueno, very soon, so that's why I'm not reacting to it. Ahí, I'm just uh, saving this, taking a sip or two. Give me a sec. Uh, so, yeah, I, I will end the stream in like five minutes. Mm. It was a lot of fun. I was a little bit quiet near the end because I was replying to messages on my phone and I was checking on a few other things and I got a little bit distracted because you know I have I have my little my little issues with being unable to concentrate on something for too long. <laughs> But at least I'm happy. I am very happy with um, the amount of progress I made here and on the other one. I might continue on the other one tomorrow and finish it tomorrow because I'm not gonna finish it today. I don't see myself finishing it today. But, uh, oh, this one doesn't have the nose thing. Let me see. Yeah, it doesn't have the nose thing. Let me fix that before I export it. I always forget these kind of deals, like when they have those, it's like, this little spot right here, you know. I'm not saying it's bad. My character has a tiny heart on her back and people often forget to draw it when I, when I get something drawn of her looking from the side or something like that. It's like, yep, you forgot the little heart. It's, it's right there. I know it's tiny and maybe you thought it was just a little detail I added. Nope, it's, it's an actual heart. And I don't mind uh, correcting artists or fixing it myself. Most of, most of the time I just fix it myself because it's a tiny heart and you can just boop, put it there, you know. Let me make it a little bit more 
looking like. There you go. Okay. That's better. Eight and nine. Give me just one second. I had to check one thing. I'm missing what? I think I didn't do the crying one. Let me see. I did everything else except for the crying one. Yep. <laughs> I forgot. I got 9 out of 10 done. I am so smart. I had to do the, the crying one, but I don't have any more time left for today. But I might come back and finish it another time. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the help. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you so much, Luna, for the subscription. And uh, yeah, I'll see you back tomorrow on another stream. Close to the same time. I might not stream later uh on the day i know that i might possibly get more people to join the stream if i stream later at night but sadly i cannot because uh i have other things to do starting from 4 p.m on the dot onward so yeah thank you so much for watching thank, thank you so much for staying for the whole four hours and yeah, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.